Welcome to the Cincy Postcast. I am your host, Kevin Wallace, and we have a very full episode for you in this one. A proper three-parter. In part one, it's all about the latest signing, or at least expected signing for FC Cincinnati, Pavel Bucha. Uh, midfielder out of the Czech League. Man, this is this is a fun one to talk about. This is great to see new talent, new players coming into the team. In part two, it's sort of a rumors wrap-up, roundup type thing. Where is Barial going? Is Santi Arias going somewhere? What else could be going on with this team? What else is out there around FC Cincinnati? We try to cover any of it and all of it there. And then in part three, it is another installment of the film room. We watch Netflix's space opera Rebel Moon. And boy, do we have opinions on this one. Uh, We also touch on a little bit there in part one. And I say a little bit, it goes on for far too long. Uh, Some of the new stuff we've got going on uh, this year with the post. So feel free to skip ahead 20, 30 minutes. You can always find the uh, timestamps down in the bottom there if you're not uh, interested in us talking about Patreon and YouTube and things like that. But uh, otherwise, we've got you covered with FCC stuff. You throw all that together, you got yourself a postcast. Joining me to talk about all of that and more, I've got two gentlemen ready to dive into weird internet rumors and sleuthing with me. I'm joined by the Chief. I'm joined by Grayson. Uh, But Chief, let me start with here. Condolences to your Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I know this is a rough one. I'm I'm glad that you've joined us to powering through this, this tough moment for you personally. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know what? I'm not mad they lost because they, this is, you know, very sports cliche. No one expected us to be here. Mm -hmm. Um, Picked in the lower 20s, upper 20s of the NFL power rankings to start the year. Hell of a year from Baker Mayfield. I'm more mad that Detroit won because (laughs) I hate feel good stories in sports about other teams. I hate it. I hate this forced narrative. They're showing this video before the game narrated by Jeff Daniels, where there's this fossil that's a billion years old who's been going to games for 60 years and he's never seen his team win. I hate that. You know what? And I hate it specifically because teams I root for are never feel good stories. Where was the feel good story energy for FC Cincinnati last year? Where was everyone, excuse me, where was everyone uniting to support FC Cincinnati? For this suffering fan base that had gone, you know, multiple years finishing dead last, people hated us as much as they made fun of us when we were bad. Like, I'm okay with if it's going to be feel good sports stories, they need to be equally applied and they're never applied to teams I like. So, you know what? I want you to be miserable, too. If you're never going to be happy for me, I'm going to wish unhappiness on you. So (laughs) go Niners. That's what I'm saying. I uh, I will say, though, for me. Baker Mayfield was my feel good story because I think that that guy, along with there's a whole class of quarterbacks that are in the Baker Mayfield camp. Uh, I would include Andy Dalton in this as well, which is that they're perfectly fine quarterbacks, right? Like you're allowed to be not a Hall of Famer quarterback in the NFL. Like there is not enough respect for just like good above average guys, a guy that you can plug in for your franchise for 10 years. You don't need to worry about it. Could you improve it? Sure. But you don't need to. Build a better team around those guys. They never do. They never get respect. They're always linked to like some awful coach. You never see an Andy Dalton with like a Hall of Fame coach. You you also uh, also never see an Andy Dalton win a Super Bowl, which is the problem here. (laughs) But you do, you do. You will who? see you will see bad co- Joe Flacco is an Andy Dalton quarterback who won the Super Bowl okay, not that long ago. That's, Trent that's Dilfer. one. That's one. That's one. Like, Trent Dilfer, <laughs> uh the Tampa Bay Buccaneers own Brad Johnson. Right. These guys can win you Super Bowls. You, have to you like, just yeah, need but, to build a better team around them. No, you like okay, you want to win a Super Bowl with Brad Johnson, you've got to have five Hall of Famers on defense. Like <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> fine. That's fine. You want to win one with Trent Dilfer? You need Ray Lewis and Ed Reed to do that. Like, I promise you, the Ed Reed Ray Lewis defense is cheaper than the Patrick Mahomes offense. I'll tell you that much. It's just they've every. And the other thing too is that like every rule change they've made in professional football has been to make it easier to pass. So like the era of we're gonna grind a game out fifteen to ten and win with a defensive touchdown and a bunch of field goals like that 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 is a bygone era in football and you got to have somebody that can throw i'm i'm bummed but not as bummed as i'll be if the bills or the lions win the super bowl like i don't i don't the idea of seeing fan bases achieve that nirvana that is being denied to me as a sports fan in any given year i just i don't want it i you know i had this theory for a long time before he was a, a played for tampa that I always rooted for Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. Because if Tom Brady wins, it makes everyone else unhappy. And if I can't be happy, I want everyone else to share my misery. What if I offer you a Bills <coughs> Lions Super Bowl so that yes, one of them gets to be the feel good story, but the other one blows their best chance ever. No, no, that that that's a lose lose situation for me. Like okay. yeah, no. The yeah. the feel good story I never liked was when um the Red Sox were winning their first World Series in like eighty years or whatever. Yeah. And everybody got behind the Red Sox and and you know, wanted to wanted wanted to watch them break the curse. I didn't. I wanted them to never win another another game. Like they're the it's Boston. Right. Like, well, it's like it's the Cubs too. They're I one of the, the same biggest, way about the Cubs. Yeah, the Cubs, same thing. These are two of the biggest team, biggest spendiest teams in all of baseball. They didn't. They haven't won a World Series not because they're you know plucky underdogs. They haven't won a World Series because they repeatedly blow it, right? Because right? they're incompetently run organizations. They mismanage and, their fortunes. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, like, I don't want that. No, I don't want rewarded. that either. Like the the Lions, the Lions, the two best players in Lions history both quit playing football instead of spending more time in Detroit. <laughs> like <laughs> Calvin Johnson and Barry Sanders, the two of the best at their positions were like, no, no more Detroit Lions. We're done. We'd rather just we would rather do anything else but play for this abominable franchise. That I don't know really why. Why about, is that a feel good story that they're winning now? The thing about the NFL also is because it's so rigged to prevent you from not rigged it may be rigged but not it's it's designed in a way yes. to make it very hard to suck for a long period of time yeah like it's not that hard to be kind of mediocre for a long sustained period of time so like there's really no excuse for the the some of the, like the stretches that the Lions had, right? And I don't know who their I don't know who their owners are, but oh, this little this little plucky <clears throat> underdog called is the, Ford? the Ford family. Is it, the, is it still the Ford family? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, they also have <laughs> the initials. So, the, they look, got the be... initials of the dead owner on their uniform. <clears throat> Dude croaked like ten years ago, and they still have his initials on the damn jersey. <laughs> look, uh, I saw Ford versus Ferrari, and I wasn't even really rooting for Ford. <laughs> in that one so i'm not I'm, you know by american or whatever but also if you feel compelled to make uh detroit your underdog team i'll have you know that they started as a franchise in southern ohio portsmouth ohio they were the portsmouth uh spartans municipal stadium there and their owners relocated them Back in the day, they moved to Detroit. They struggled for a long time, and they came up with this gimmick that they would play on Thanksgiving, and that is why they still do that. It was like a minor league baseball gimmick because the relocation wasn't going well. They stole a team from Ohio. This is all I'll say on the matter to finish it out, is that Please. in that stadium today, of all those uh, celebrating Lions fans, Detroit losers, there was probably some percentage of people in that stadium that were also Detroit City fans. <laughs> and if if it, if you are okay with people like that being oh, happy, no. oh, I no. don't know that this is the podcast for you. 
<laughs> we are anti DCFC happiness. I think and that always is... <laughs> and always have been and always will be. <laughs> oh my god. Um well, speaking of crying poor uh as a as a franchise, uh the post this past week we cried poor a little bit, all right? We we took to the internet and we asked <laughs> We asked for some money. We we started a Patreon account. Uh, I I had it in my mind that we just needed enough to cover our expenses. I thought that was a good a good target. And uh, someone I don't know who because it's certainly not people who listen to this podcast uh, decided to support us, and we sold out of spots uh, within about thirty minutes, which still blows my mind uh i my phone melted down for like that first 20 minutes it's just non-stop notifications realized i had not turned off notifications on certain apps and yeah uh i was i was blown away well what got me more than that were the jerks the absolute assholes who have reached out since then saying hey can you please open up some more spots? I really want to give you some money. I don't know where this is coming from. Uh, no, I, I we really appreciate the support. I appreciate the support. Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and open it up. So by the time you listen to this, I've, I'm lifting the cap on this. I I just people seem really hell bent on supporting us financially. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll make that we'll make that possible to you. But uh, yeah, Grayson. Our our first foray into uh, into begging, I'd say, went pretty successful. I don't know thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I, I just want to make clear, like I think people think that we're joking when we say that there's not going to be like any promised benefits <laughs> yeah. for the pa- for the Patreon <laughs> tier or whatever. Not um, a joke. <laughs> so, like, we already do during the season two episodes a week. Which is insane. Like it's a lot. <laughs> it, it makes my wife ask a lot of questions. I'll say that. Same. Yeah, I, I, I. Yeah, I'm tired of having the same conversations every week too. But um, <laughs> wait, this the, podcast or your wife? Um, hang on. Uh, with my with my wife. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> um, and she also like gets a little conf. And I, I I hate to be like, oh, I have to do this. Right. 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 But like, you know, there's only like certain times that we would have available to actually like record and we have to get like all three of us together and available. So kind of like saying like, well, no, we can't just do this at like six in the morning or or like, like we can't just like displace this to like, <laughs> anyway, I don't right. need to talk about this anymore. But um <laughs> But uh, uh, with the with the money thing, like and the Patreon tiers and stuff, there's not tiers, first of all. Yeah. And like we already do two episodes, a, two episodes a week during the season. Um, I like I want to be clear. We love we love all 12 listeners. Yeah. And um, we love the support. And. Kevin's uh, wallet uh, is going to be really appreciative of the support because, you know, he's not going to be running this in the red for <laughs> perpetuity. Yeah. Remember, um, as awkward as our conversations are with our wives, it's got to be even more awkward in, in Kevin's household where it's like, wait, you're spending all this time doing this and you're spending money on it. Yeah. Every um, time the uh, the Zoom <clears throat> bill hits the account, like. I mean, it's not much, don't get me wrong, but it's just like, really? It's just like another kick in the shins after all the time I spent. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, and, and I just want to say, like, we're, there's not going to be, as far as I'm concerned, like any any promised, you know, additional benefits. Um, We do have the channel. Yeah. That you Ooh. can look at, but not post or interact with in any way correct um, yeah, you, so can't, you can't add a reaction to it either i will not allow any any way shape or form of communication to, to happen right. there it's just this uh it's like when you go to like a you see those pictures of guys going to like comic cons and there'll be like sarah michelle geller there 
And yes. it's like they got to do the hover hand for the picture. <laughs> right? like you can't actually touch the, the talent, um, but you can That's get your channel. picture. Right. That's the channel. Um, and uh, uh, what, what I, I kind of lost my lost my train of thought on that. But anyway, like, you know, we yeah. appreciate it. We love we love you guys. Uh, and. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it does like if we ha- if we do build up a little little bit of a you know, a couple bucks to spend, you know, it makes things easier to like do like an away day or if we want to do like an event somewhere that requires yeah. some type of some type of deposit or something. Like these things become possibilities. Yeah, yeah like it would be nice to have, you know, like Jim Trace out to play hope fest and not have to you know send a message to schwai and be like hey i know we use your band's music for free on the show would you mind playing a free show for us as well yeah yeah there's there's certainly been times where i've looked at you know hiring uh someone to shoot video or something for an idea and then the more i think about it the more i think uh no i don't want to spend any more money on this (laughs) that's okay and the the ar on on Pat Brennan's retainer. That's Oof. that's climbing. So yeah, yeah. It's you know we 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 have him there for when we need, and uh, yeah, that's good and useful. But he's he's not cheap. All right, he works for you know, the paper of record in Cincinnati. Okay, like you have to pay for something like that. Um, and it's not to say there are zero benefits. Uh, your name may or may not be highlighter pink in the Discord. That is a perk that you get. Uh, it's not clear that that's applying to everybody. If you hear this and it's not applying to you and you are a Patreon, uh, subscriber, reach out to me. I will try to fix that I, as I best guess I you, can. I guess people are going to get the opportunity to like ask a question. Yes. And that's once the a other month, big but, one. But look, I have no idea how you ask this question, where you ask this question, to <laughs> whom you pose this question. This is none of my business. <laughs> also, I think it's very important to note. All we're promising is that you get to ask the question. Nowhere does it say it'll be answered. <laughs> I love the idea of just <laughs> listing everyone's questions. At the Here end. are the questions we and got look, from the listeners this week. All, that you, was fun. all you people in the discord that are asking questions, uh, freeloading, that's going to stop. Oh yeah. No, <laughs> you, if you're, we're banning, we're going to implement a bot that just bans question marks in the server. It yeah. will flag question marks as uh, inappropriate language and you will be removed from the server. <laughs> nope. It, that's just like, this is why I've, I've not been answering them. You know, you might wonder if it's possible to keep Boreal till the summer. I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. Unless, unless you want to pay yeah, exactly unless I see that name, $2. That, unless I see that name flash pink right there, in which case, you know, <laughs> I'll do my best to answer. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, in terms of the mechanics of the question, I don't know. Leave that to me. I'll, I, I'm sure Patreon has some built-in tools or, you know, built-in tools I can, I can leverage here to, to get something from people. Um, but you yeah, do no, like thank DMs you. on Patreon, right? Uh, yes. I think I need to send a message to all everyone and that opens up the ability for for questions and comments like that yeah remember it's only fans that are allowed to ask questions <laughs> only fans <laughs> should have called that tier only fan so you could say you're an only fan <laughs> subscriber to the post <laughs> uh jokes you think of later um i will say though uh, not related to the Patreon, although maybe a little bit related to the Patreon, uh, but not exclusive. Um, I know I am making a commitment to try to do more video this year. Uh, for some reason, uh, we did not have an Instagram account, or at least we had one, but it was being not used. Uh, we fired that up. So links to uh, YouTube and Instagram in the uh, in the show notes of the uh, the podcast, and then uh, Chief, are we doing are we doing something of a Facebook page? Is that is that what I said? Yeah, we there? have a Facebook page. Oh, Maybe I'll look see at us go! I know, right? So, <laughs> if you want to share our content with your parents, that would be the easiest way to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We're, we're trying to cover all platforms except for TikTok right now because uh, honestly, I'm terrified of that. I don't. I can't that's, dance. That's my problem. Sounds scary. Yeah. LinkedIn. Uh, How about LinkedIn? Can we do that? LinkedIn would be great. Like our posts will be like, you know, 
I was walking on my way to a job interview today to interview for the postcast, <laughs> and I stopped to feed a homeless person. And when I got to my interview, you'll never believe who was interviewing me. The man in front of me who did not feed the homeless person. That guy's a <laughs> jerk. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think a, a LinkedIn account that is are, are you all on about- LinkedIn. I can't figure out what LinkedIn is for. Like, uh, like all I can see on there is it's like it's some combination of like people bragging about themselves and like really stupid alpha male grind set business stuff yeah. where it's like people who would post stuff like, um, you know, I don't use the bathroom. I dominate my toilet every day or something like that. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the like other... you have to use it if you're looking for a job though, I feel like in, the, in my world anyway, the other, um, yeah, the way I think about LinkedIn is like, you kind of have to be on there, but you don't want to do anything that makes people notice that you're on there. Y- yes. I like the partic- verification yeah. that you're on there. Yep. Great. But don't like, don't go viral on <laughs> LinkedIn. Um, but the other, the other genre of like LinkedIn post is like, weird weepy performative thing where it's like finding some like deeper meaning but it's connected to your uh you know small like single family home landlord business yes like i've learned learned a valuable lesson and that's what makes me a good salesman like right (laughs) or like or like like posts about like the human connection between you and like handing this family like keys to their home that's not really their home it's actually yours they're just paying all of your expenses for it and buying it for you <laughs> it's like it's a nice. way for venture capitalists to feel profound well wait chief this is what you do every time you have the thought of doing one of the the world soccer talk prompts or whatever the pitch bot uh Throw it into chat GPT, make it write the article, post all that to LinkedIn. That's just, <laughs> that's the content of the post. It's just that it's chat GPT spitting out. Cause you know, hustle and grind and use AI to find new opportunities for yourself. Like nothing matches up more than nonsense gibberish from chat GPT than LinkedIn. I think that's perfect. I'm into it. Let's do it. It's a new it's a new post for 2023. This is what we're using our Patreon money for. It's great ideas like this. I'm going to post a great video of me crying uh, on LinkedIn about crying about having to lay off all of the writers at the post. So it hurts me as a CEO. Here's the only demand that I have about the LinkedIn. Okay, is um, after you create the LinkedIn. Yes. And it's got to be like make it a fully public profile, all that. Click on and view the profile of every FC Cincinnati team employee that you can find on LinkedIn. Okay. So that they get the notification. (laughs) (laughs) The posts viewed your profile. We're always watching. <laughs> no, no, what? No requests. To, what do they call it? To connect? We're not going to try to connect with no, anyone. We're just no. going to. We're just going to take. We're, we're just watching. viewing. Actually, I always love this. So I don't know if anybody else is like me, but uh, I only update my LinkedIn account when I am looking for a job, and so I always then sort of assume everybody else is the same way as me so if i ever see somebody like updating their linkedin like oh it's a new new picture sometimes i'll get a random email (laughs) makes it through the spam filter like so and so updated the picture be like oh looking for a job hey someone's on someone's available (laughs) single and looking to mingle (laughs) so yeah we'll we'll give you updates uh up to the minute updates on fcc employees updating their linkedin profiles we should also probably connect with all like the agents that represent these players on like MLS and stuff like that. That's that's phase two. That and sounds useful. Say, hit him, hit him in the DMs. Hey, <laughs> you heard anything about Clayton to FCC? Um, you want to come? You want to come work for us? Wait. <laughs> stalking the FC Cincinnati employees. That's phase one. All yes. right. So let's let's finish phase one before we talk about phase two. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, keep daily screen captures of everybody. I can I can, I can just I can just feel it. Twenty twenty four is the year of the postcast. Like we're to the moon. <laughs> we 
because we have a LinkedIn account. Because we have a but LinkedIn account. But not yet. Account. We're really thinking about it, though. Because we've thought about adding LinkedIn to our social media empire. Should we? I'm not saying we should. I'm asking if we should. Okay. Should we take the Patreon money and put it in crypto? <laughs> Only if we buy that uh, the new uh, NFT from the uh, disgraced former Spanish uh, FA president who launched his own <laughs> NFT coin after being uh, either either banned from football. Yeah, either his NFT or you can buy a trading card that is a swatch of the suit that Donald Trump uh, wore when he was arrested and had his mugshot taken. One the, of those two. The digital representation of a swatch of the suit. Wow. I didn't know I didn't know NFTs were still a thing, incidentally. I thought we'd all sort of moved on past that. But like I got hit up with an ad. That's on the problem the, with uh, them is they were never a thing. <laughs> right. You, it was never <laughs> like quite literally you it was never, never had a thing. A thing. <laughs> yeah. But I I, hit, I got hit with an ad on the bird app this week that was uh for a new form of NFT slash video game slash collectible worms that definitely didn't look like they were generated using a AI art generator of <laughs> worms that were slack jawed that all kind of resembled pop culture characters. And it was an advertisement to invest in the worm platform. And then you could buy use tokens that you win in fights with other worms to buy more worms or accessories and outfits for your worm. Wow. And it was kind of like NFTs meet Pokemon meets um, garden worms. Wow. And yeah, no. And then everyone involved in this uh, project seemed to have a Russian surname. So I thought maybe, maybe I was missing out on a valuable opportunity here. So if I get my share of the Patreon money, I'm buying a worm. That's what I, that's my I'm pledge. not going to look, I'm not going to look for the worms because my, my one like I just had this like kind of negative visceral reaction when NFTs like first came out. And it's cuz like the aesthetic of all of them, like the yeah. bored apes, the grumpy cats deeply deeply fucked vibes. Like demonic. <laughs> like awful. Well, like not only demonic, but also it's like it's like so, okay, so I had a bet, I had a, a, a take a while. Apologize for for cursing. But you none know, of this, none just of this is making to. the making the final cut. Oh, right. fair I'm enough. Just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not editing no, I, this. I, I had a theory back in the day that Cardi B was the result of a bet between several people in the music industry to see how who the least talented person they could make go number one was. But like, I'm thinking that like with NFTs, it's Jack Harlow. That, yeah, not actually. wrong on that one either. Um, <laughs> but with NFTs, I thought it was kind of a the gimmick was like what is the shittiest form of art we can get people to buy? And like anyone, if you did some really, really nice digital artwork, you could probably con someone into buying it. But like pixel apes that look like they're stoned, if you can sell that, you truly are a world-class salesman and you truly have pulled the wool over everyone's eyes. Like that's an accomplishment to get people to think they were worth actual money. You know what they all look like? They all look like the mayor's son in season two of True Detective. <laughs> that's such a good pull <laughs> anyway damn. anyway net nfts yeah damn. phenomenal <laughs> oh anyway buy buy the patreon support us on patreon i don't know how you're supposed to phrase that but yeah the Patreon, uh, we're we're lifting we're lifting the the training wheels off well training wheels off of it so if you're mad that your name didn't get to be pink, we got you. All or, right? we got you, know, you. You, don't, you also don't have to you keep listening no, if you want. Please. Yeah. No. Yeah. You no. don't have to. You don't have to listen either. The, whatever you want to do. It's Gucci. We're here for you. Yes. You live your, be you live your best <laughs> life is all we're here for. We are. Unless we are, you're a Detroit Lions fan. You want to get in the discord and just screenshot stuff and send it to your group chat. That's fine, too. Yeah, honestly. I'd almost prefer that. <laughs> yeah, you know what I would like more than you subscribing to our Patreon? If you'd retweet the episode link so we can grow the podcast. Yeah, the well, share, get... share some of our awful thoughts with people yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, send a link on your group chat. It's like, hey, listen to these knuckleheads that I listen to for two hours a week. Sometimes oh, four. God. <laughs> yeah, well, speaking of listening for two hours, we're half an hour in. We should probably make mention of the fact that FC Cincinnati does appear to be signing a new player and 
by all appearances, a pretty good one uh, here. So FC Cincinnati to sign midfielder Pavel Bucha. I don't know. Uh, please correct me, Grayson. Pavel. 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 Pavel, Pavel Bucha. Not Pavel. No, no not obviously, Pavel. obviously not a Star Trek fan. Pavel Bucha uh, is coming out of the Czech first division, uh, has not appeared for the Czech national team, although looking around on the Internet, looks like he is sort of in line to be heading that way. He's been called up ah, and okay. made the bench. He has not made any appearances for the senior team, it's but he's one caps. of those guys who was at the various uh, uh, youth levels. And, you know, like the Czech team is pretty good. Yes. Um, so, yeah, exciting news there. Uh, it looks like there may have been some Bundesliga interest as well for him. Uh, Which the does... Athletic will deny. Yeah, of course. Of course. Nobody else yeah. was interested. If FC Cincinnati wanted him, nobody else could touch him. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the uh, the stats that I've seen online look pretty good. Uh, he looks looks like a decent player. I'm not going to pretend to know anything about him or my favorite debate, which I'm more than happy to have, which is, is, is the Czech first division better or worse than MLS? Uh, well, that's do always, they have pro rel? Uh, well, yes, of course. And do they play the European calendar? Uh, they do. Probably. No, By I definition, that, they do. They're in Europe. That, <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, fair enough. <laughs> so based on those two criteria alone, I believe world soccer talk would say, yes, they are better than MLS. They are better. So there you go. The, the, Poor bastard's been tricked into uh, taking a step down in his minutes, but or it is uh, quality. Uh, but no, he'll he'll come to FC Cincinnati. Um, We're thinking he's a Moreno replacement, right? Yeah, I, th- I, I think so. I think so. He seemed yeah. like I watched a little bit of his highlights uh, when the news came out. He seems like he's a little more up to go forward than Moreno would have yes. been, and is a little more attack minded, which. I think I like when you've got Obi as a pure defensive ball winning midfielder. I think it allows if you want to have someone that can drift a little more advanced in the, in that box to box midfielder role. I don't know. I I like that he's younger. I think this team probably needed to get a little younger in a few spots just in terms of maintaining fitness level through the MLS season. So I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on him, but I think I like the signing. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm of course not going to claim to be an expert on him either. Um, I did try to One find. Of us should pretend. I'll do it. Okay. I did Go try ahead, to find Grayson. like a. I tried to find as many as many clips of him, uh, today as I, as I could, and I agree that he um he does seem to be more active moving the ball forward than we've seen from Moreno, um, I saw a lot of clips where he had a good ability to make either like a line breaking pass. Or one of those, you know, long over the over the air passes to find a find a running striker, um, like a number of those pretty pretty impressive uh, forward passing ability. Um, uh, he does. Um, he looks like he's also pretty active in there when they're pressing. Like I saw clips where he was even like at the front of their press and you know making mm. runs at the at the goalkeeper. Um, he plays central midfielder. He's played a little bit of attacking midfield for them. Um, not a ton. And if, so it looks like the way Victoria Pilsen, which is the team that he's coming from, uh, play, it looks like they usually play in a three, five, two, and he plays next to a center defensive midfielder who has more defensive responsibilities, which is, you know, plug and play into where we'd expect him to to play for for us um Mm -hmm. and uh he's 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 got like a he's a little tricksy on the dribble like a little surprisingly like i didn't see a ton of like dribbling highlights but he has like a he has a move that he likes um that seems to work at least in the czech league a bit um he doesn't lose the ball a lot basically never in a dangerous area as well Love that. Um, he's active in counterattacks, but it looks like he's primarily passing in counterattacks, like being part of the buildup and not, you know, taking the ball down or, or making a 
which is uh, which is streaking good. run, which is really we, good. Yeah, because we have guys that want to be on the other end of those. You Bupenza and even Lucho Acosta, for that matter, yeah. are guys that are going to want to play a little more advanced. And having a second player that's willing to advance the ball forward into those spaces is good. He um, seemed to lack that a little bit when Lucho wasn't feeling it last year. Yeah. I saw I saw a stat that looked like he was near top of the league of the Czech league in um, dangerous recoveries per 90. So that's like, you know, Ooh. winning the ball high up the high up the field. Um, oh, not like a helicopter rescue of a hiker. Right, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, he chief mentioned, I think I think chief mentioned he has five goals this year in the in the league in 17 appearances. Um, he does seem to like to shoot outside the box and he's got kind of a crackerjack shot. Um, hmm. and so, oh, and uh, he basically never gets carded. Like he had that he had a he got a straight red in a Champions League game against Inter Milan like two years ago. Good, but if you go, but if you Maybe. go back, um, through his like he gets like one yellow card a season. Damn. I also so, like that he is he's twenty five. Yep, and this feels like a move where okay. He's not young by any stretch of the imagination, but he's also not old. And you think that like this could be a there obviously wasn't a step up in weight class for him to Serie A, the Bundesliga, the Premier League. But this feels like a good he feels like a good age to go and get someone from Europe where they might still have a little bit of that drive, a little bit of that hunger. He's not coming here for his last payday like some of the players that you see coming over from Europe. And it's maybe a step up in weight class, but I don't like if the Czech league is worse than MLS, it's not a ton worse than MLS. If it's better than MLS, it's not a ton better than MLS. So it, it could hopefully is another situation like where we fished uh, Wobodo and um, in Bupenza with a Turkish league, I want to say for both yeah. of them. Yeah. yeah. Where it's like, okay, the league profile well, uh, is really what you're had for. been in Turkish league, but we got him from, from Saudi. Saudi. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I like the age. I like the idea. I also like the idea too that when you're getting a guy to replace Moreno, maybe you're getting a guy who can be that box to box midfielder, but that can also occasionally allow Lucho to drift forward. Because we saw last year that one of the tricks that they used or that Noonan liked to do to keep Lucho on the field but to reduce his work rate and reduce his workload was to push him up to striker. Mm -hmm. And this gives you another option of someone who can then slot over into that 10 attacking role and let, let Kubo be the box to box midfielder. And then all of a sudden you have morphed your attack into something where you have two people that are attack minded in the midfield and Lucho able to save a little wear and tear on his legs or, you know, maybe even come off occasionally uh, and, save it for the postseason. Yeah, and yeah. you know, on the relative strength of the Czech League, I mean, I think it's just like any European league, right? There's going to be some big teams that could, that could probably hold their own against some teams in MLS, but there's like a lot of small teams that would just, you know, or USL level or worse. Um, but he does, you know, he played on a pretty big team. Uh, they won the league, I think, like two years ago. Yeah. Um. And, you know, they finish in European position like he was a Champions League player. Uh, They got their ass kicked in Champions League, but their group was Inter Milan, Barcelona and Bayern Munich. Um. So, you know, no, yeah. no shade, you know, really um, would have been pretty impressive to have advanced to be expected. there. Yeah. So, expected. you know, he may have. I. I, I he certainly would have experience, plenty of experience playing against players, the quality of MLS. Um, there's, but there's the issue that when you come to MLS, there's the, not just the travel, but you don't get like, you don't really get games off. Like you don't play some, there's not like a tiny team that yeah. doesn't have any players, right? Like there's a, there's much, much less variation between the teams in the league. So mm -hmm. it's like a tough game or a relatively tough game like every week. Yeah. Um, right. And players do struggle with that sometimes. All that said, 
you know, I love the age, like Chief said, you know, you want to get younger there. Um, so even if he isn't, even if he is like not an upgrade over Moreno at all, you got to think you're sitting better with a player who's 25 than right. a player who's what, 32, 33? A lot less mileage on the tires. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I... I loved the profile of the player, like the stuff that I saw about him, both in the tape and the stats. It just all screamed to me like. You can see exactly where he fits in with the roster. Yeah, yeah and should of- should fit well with the way FC Cincinnati plays. My only concern, Kevin, this is probably more towards you, but I'll, you know, it's the, for the group's consumption here. Is it just me or my only hang up with this signing? and? My only sort of like, you know, pause. It does feel like this team has been burned a lot when it goes to Europe for players mm. versus mm-hmm. going to South America and Central America. So it's Albright hasn't, yeah. though. That's I know Albright thing. hasn't. No, to be Obi, fair. Obi was a. I think Obi's pretty much the only direct from Europe transfer we've we've gotten, right? Under. Albright. Under Under Albright, Albright, yes. I mean, I guess you could technically count Matt Miazga, but it was an American player coming home. And he was on a free. Yeah. Um, So that's another point is um, I don't know what the market for this player was. Like we did see reports that he had some opportunities in the Bundesliga. You could probably guess, though, that which teams like would and would not have been included in that. Yeah. Uh, description, right? Like he's like it's not Bayern Munich. No. Right. He was like also, maybe, he, he'd he was be also a Bayern a, Munich player. If right. it was Bayern Munich. Yeah. Um but but um they did have to pay about one point seven five million dollars oh, reported. Been, has that been confirmed now? It has it's it's what the Czech media yeah. reported. Yeah, the European outlets are saying that amount. Um, okay, so one point so f- seven, so about like what, like four hundred fifty thousand no, dollars i think they said oh sorry go ahead so about four hundred fifty thousand dollars of budget hit a year to amortize this no it'll be more than that it would be a little over five right 500 between yeah. five and six yeah um it, that's assuming a three-year deal we also haven't seen any any information about length of the deal my mm-hmm. guess is it's going to be like a three plus one because that seems yeah. pretty standard for these two would be too yeah. short to like you're you're eating too much transfer fee and, you know, I, I just, four, you just don't really see a lot of like players signing like, you know, four or five guaranteed. Does four or deal. five reduce the budget hit, though? Yeah. Does the it, longer the guaranteed okay. term, the smaller budget hit from the from the transfer fee. So maybe maybe four years, maybe five years. I don't know. The other, the other thing to remember about this player was that um, when it comes to the transfer fees, my understanding was that he was only on a six. He only had six months remaining on his deal. Yep. Mm-hmm. So he would have been available on a free this summer. But Albright made the decision to go out and pay to get him right now. My guess is. His, yeah, sorry to interrupt. But no, just and just go get him now. And so, yeah, I was going to mention actually, that. That's actually a, that's actually a decently for a player that only has six months to go on the contract. That's actually a pretty decent transfer fee to pay yeah. for a player with leverage. We'll say, yeah, because um, that could be the only reason we were able to get him right. And mm-hmm. I think the fact that we had to pay almost almost two million dollars reportedly uh, for a player who's only had six months left on his deal out of the Czech league. That does tell me that there was probably a market for this player. Yeah. And that, right. that, that if there weren't, if there weren't active bidders for his transfer fee right now, the market for him on a free in the summer would have made it impossible for us to, for us yeah. to get him. That's right. my, that's my guess. Well, so if people aren't aware, and we've we've talked about this before, and it's frustrating that like <laughs> it's just sort of an unwritten rule that this gets broken all the time. Uh, players aren't allowed to discuss terms and deals with other teams unless they are granted permission by the team that they are currently under contract with, with the exception of when they are in the last six months of their current contract. Then they can begin negotiations for essentially free agency moves in the upcoming 
uh, transfer window. So yeah, that's exactly it. There's a chance that he he could have been looking at a you know a, a a decent offer from someone in the Bundesliga, but only on a free. But with his his team that he has a contract with now probably agrees to these terms. Okay, well now he has the option to to not agree to terms with FCC, but we kind of jumped the line there and and are offering him that money right away. Uh which is great. Like this this does tell me that Albright really wants this guy. That right. if this was option C, he'd be willing to wait until summer and see what else comes up. But this guy is clearly a priority. And on the I'm curious also to see what we find out about salary. Yeah, when that's released, but I don't expect it to be on that big of a number. Um, it looks like he made just under two hundred thousand in the Czech league. I mean, yeah, the the reliability of the numbers you find for this stuff is is always very questionable. But um, you don't need to like if if it's a if these are like bottom middle to bottom of the pack Bundesliga teams. Mm -hmm. We talked about this a little bit with Miles Robinson, like. Not all these teams are paying these guys, you know, six, seven million dollars a year, like a lot of guys are on low, on low six figure salaries. So you could bring him in at, you know, the 400 to 500 range. And that's a huge salary jump from where he was. But also probably charge under a million, which would be and probably. you know, more than competitive with the kinds of kinds of Bundesliga teams, if he was talking to Bundesliga teams that he would have been negotiating with. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, as uh, as somebody who is a self-proclaimed expert on our uh, good friend here, uh, Pavel Buka. Uh, Buka, Still sorry, Pavel. excuse me. Wow, Pavel. Wow. Wow. Did I really just screw it up again? That's Man. all right. We're off. We're off to a flying start of me being an he's expert. The new, he's the new Alec Khan. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Pavel Bucha. Uh, he is born in uh, the Czech Republic, but I love this. I love. I was going to try his hometown, and I'm I'm <laughs> abandoning that ship right here and now. Uh, but I love this. So he uh, originally was on a deal with uh, Slavia Prague. Mm-hmm. And his deal with them, uh, things were going well, as far as I can tell, with Slavia Prague. Uh, but he did not want to extend his contract with them. So talking about you know him going to, uh, to become a free agent here in the summer, he refused to extend his contract with them. So they uh, sent him down to the youth team there. He took that as him being cut from the team, uh, sued on breach of contract, and immediately signed with Victoria Pilsen, which is the <laughs> uh, the team that he's with now, which is incredible. I love I love that story that he was demoted. So he walked across the street uh, to their rivals and signed with uh, signed with the rivals. Which I, I, love, I absolutely I, love that. I love it because it means if he ever finds himself in a situation like Matt Miazga was um, in the playoffs, He's not going to storm the locker room, sir. He's going to lawyer up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those uh, uh, MLS, MLS rule conspiracy theorists are going to, maybe they found the guy who's finally going to challenge the option. Oh, uh, yeah. I've, I've, is... th- that's been a thing you see in like <laughs> yep. orbiting around MLS forever is that like there's options a bunch illegal. of fans that are yeah. convinced that like options are illegal and MLS is terrified that somebody's going to like challenge the options and and all that and you know it's literally never happened. Yeah. Also and in fact, options and Kaka lost the arbitration but that's 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 for another <laughs> that's for another day. Um I feel like MLS is not the only league that uses options. That would be insane if yeah. just in the world of soccer. Uh, no, what I really like about this guy, though, is it, it, we've alluded to it throughout this. At a minimum, he appears to be a more versatile player. He is not a strictly attacking midfielder with no defensive chops. He is not a defensive midfielder who can't you know, pass or dribble to save his life. Uh, this is a player that does appear to be more well-rounded 25 years old he should be in his prime he is fighting for a chance to be on his national team roster um got yeah, married like, last summer got married Cincinnati's i don't know if he a has lovely any... place to raise a family yeah exactly. sales pitch 
if if he has a kid or is is soon to have a kid, if that's in his future, you, you couldn't couldn't find a better place. You know, Cincinnati really is the Paris of the Midwest. Uh, so yeah, bring it on. That's every Good. every young Czech, uh, every young Czechian Czechian's dream is to come to Cincinnati. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not a moment too soon we're a month away from the season somehow and let's yes. let's get some players in because this this guy appears to be penciled into the starting lineup immediately upon arrival yeah i mean yeah. if they um i i wonder i mean you know i i assume kubo is gonna get a chance to to yeah. win a starting spot or even you know angulo would have the mm-hmm. opportunity to play himself into a starting spot if he if he improved i don't i don't view this guy as necessarily a nailed on starter yeah but i just think there's gonna, i, think I do there's think be a he's lot. probably yeah i think there's gonna be a lot of minutes for guys this year i think that i hope at least and it sounds like from hearing some of the comments that have come out since the the season ended just this understanding that the team ran out of gas last year and they need to the priority is not so much winning every game and winning supporter shield again it's being fresh and keeping legs fresh for what's going to be a grueling year this year in terms of playing in CONCACAF Champions Cup. Uh, they're said they're making changes to the League's Cup schedule is the big rumor now. We don't know what those are. Um, who knows what's going on with the U.S. Open Cup plus the MLS season and MLS Cup, whatever the format that's going to be. There will be a lot of minutes for guys like Kubo mm-hmm. and Angulo and whoever they get as an additional striker there will still be room for baird i think as they go forward and there'll be lots Mm -hmm. there'll be a lot of minutes available on this team just because i don't think that they can have another year next year like they had this year where they ran the same guys out so often and they're probably getting they're probably pushing up against the window to like i'm not saying it's past yet i think i i think there's probably still time but they're probably getting close to the window where it would be tough to sign somebody and have them ready by like Champions League, the start of the first the first round of Champions League. And I got to think that that's a that that's something that they're thinking about, right? That they're that they're concerned about is getting as many getting as, as many people available, you know, by by that by that February 22nd. Uh, yeah. Date. Yeah. So that's coming up. I mean, the good news is he is, you know, mid season right now. So mm-hmm. I like to think he'll be in game shape when he shows up. But then, yeah, obviously the the tactical game plan and all that jazz. So, um, yeah. Oh, fantastic business. Now, it should be said, <laughs> this isn't official. <laughs> Enough things have, have basically said that this is almost done and dusted i think we saw one thing that he was in for a medical either this weekend or this week so didn't see the lights on the stadium though so we're getting let down by uh our gum shoes out there yeah or or they didn't know, put him up maybe they put his name up maybe he didn't rate for stadium lights who knows maybe he's already signed he's already agreed you know there wasn't a sales pitch needed here uh they just needed him to you know run on a treadmill while they check his blood pressure or whatever so good deal yeah um, I mean, it's not announced by the team yeah. but pat tweeted we're, annou- about we're it. announcing it on we're this announcing podcast. it pat, I mean, pat, make- pat brennan acknowledged it pat's not really a you know rumor chasing news breaking yeah it's not necessarily his his beat well it's now, you know it's now as reported by the postcast so yeah that's true yeah. uh pat misses out on all the Claytons though I'll tell you that much so <laughs> it's so many names he could have said that never showed up on this team yep um cool okay well we will put our uh talk there in part one head on over to part two uh, a little bit of a rumor roundup uh and then uh <laughs> part three we jump back into the film room and before we head on over to part two, I want to tell you about our sponsor, Scentsy Shirts. And I got to be honest with you, if you've never heard of Scentsy Shirts, 
I don't believe you. Look, they are the best when it comes to FC Cincinnati gear. They are the best when it comes to Cincinnati sports gear as well. They have an amazing selection online and in their two stores, one in Hyde Park, the other in Fort Mitchell. They do amazing stuff. They can also print on demand, by the way. Go check out their stock. And when you do, if you use the code the post Cincy, all one word, all caps, they knock 10% off your order, and we kind of get to take credit for sending you over there, right? I think we can all agree that's that's fine. Just let them think that we are how you learned about them. Uh, they also have MLSPA licensed gear. Support the Players Union and FC Cincinnati players with that one. And as I said, they have print on demand in their location. So if they don't have your size in stock online, go to a store. They'll print it for you. Uh, huge thanks to Cincy Shirts for being sponsors of the podcast. Our longest running sponsor as well. Amazing, amazing guys. Happy to be working with them. Check them out again. Sensi shirts, link in description. Use the code the post Sensi. Get 10% off your entire order. It doesn't even have to be SCC gear, and you'd be doing a lot for the show. So thank you so much to Sensi Shirts and thank you for using the code. All right, we are back, and this is the part where we get to dive into rumor we we look at weird twitter accounts where we have to smash the uh the translate button you're you're trying to figure out okay translate tweet season it's the best they've got five thousand followers but what's oh. the cut off what's the cut off these days for mm. like so i look at an account and the first thing i see when there's a rumor is i check where are they from yeah check the bio to see if they write for anything or have yep. any sort of a source i'm saying if you're under seven thousand. I'm just not considering you a trustworthy source from abroad. That's a good. So I feel you and I completely agree. But then also I think like we have a pretty good track record and we only have 2000 followers. I don't know that I would so. trust us if I was. Yeah, but abroad, us. Is, <laughs> abroad is different. Yeah. Because the, the amount of people like crazy for, for soccer news in these countries is just so much more. Bastards. We were born in the wrong country. So can we start with, Alvaro Barrial, Let's because well, I want to start with Barrial because there's a lot of after there being very little smoke around Barrial, there now seems to be I don't want to call it smoke chatter, chatter, a little bit of terrorist chatter, as they used to say <laughs> uh, back in the around the turn of the century, um, a lot of chatter. But here we sit as this episode is dropped releases, it's going to release on January 22nd. There are nine days left in the European transfer window. So the hour is getting a little late for mm -hmm. Barial to move. I saw the most recent one I think we're going to talk about is what I would consider to be a preposterous tweet <laughs> that yes. linked him to Bournemouth for 8.5 million pounds, which would <laughs> actually be about $10.5 million, give or take the exchange rate on any given day. Which would break the FCC transfer record. <laughs> and what the implication was, we said no, or we were right. playing hardball in some right. way. If, yeah. you, if, right. if Brentford put, and not Brentford, Bournemouth put eight and a half million pounds on the table, Barrio would already be a Bournemouth yeah, player. There would He'd be, be a player yesterday. <laughs> there would be like a Looney Tunes like thing through the door <laughs> as he, they would have run so fast yes. to like accept this offer and get him on a plane. The and this smoke, is one, yeah. and I want to talk a little bit about the source of this rumor. Yeah, please. Um, I forget the guy's name, but there's a guy who he presents himself oh, yeah. as <laughs> as related as as a as a journalist for some BBC, uh, like regional BBC sports, yeah, site, and the like. One of the editors or something of this site has tweeted about him a couple of times like he has nothing he has never had anything to do with us he's got nothing to do with us this is a fake account people please please report him like right. as as an, as an imposter okay so that guy that guy tweets that you know um Bournemouth made an offer for eight and a half million pounds to for for Alvaro um 
The other person who pushed it was somebody from Territorio MLS, which is like a Brazil themed MLS account. I'm not really sure how to describe yeah. it, uh, but I think that they are US based, but maybe have Brazilian descent or or something. Um, also reported the eight and a half million pounds offer from Bournemouth. And then when people pointed out that like that came from a fake account, <laughs> right? he did like the most. What what I read as like a very liar guy thing to do, which was, oh, I didn't know that this guy was fake, but my sources gave me the same information. <laughs> so like, we're supposed great. to believe that this fake guy who has never gotten anything right somehow accidentally tweeted correct information about the about the Barial transfer. I mean, maybe we can, maybe this thing's going to come out tomorrow and Barial's a Burnmouth player, but I highly doubt it. Um, so funny. I'm more inclined to believe um, a couple of you know vague links to a couple of Syria A teams. We do know that. Alvarez in the process of getting his Italian citizenship. Um, so maybe that helps. Maybe I don't I don't know what if if Italy has some type of like EU passport yeah. roster slots or something. But um it can't hurt. So yeah. But yeah, I mean I it's a little weird that there hasn't been anything more concrete with him yeah. because He's such a good player. He should not be playing in MLS in in my view. So not in like a non DP deal. I mean, he's at a good age to make this move. Teams got to view him as like a potentially a sell on candidate or at least a player with a lot of good upside because he's not in his prime. Right. Yet. Right. Um, and I still expect him to be gone this window. The longer it takes, the harder it's going to be to have a replacement in for him before the season starts. And that's right. really where my head's at. Same. On the I, was about to, I was about to say the exact same thing. The I don't think he's going to be here come January 31st. My problem is I really wanted this deal in particular to get done early in the window because that is such a crucial role for this team to fill. Especially with Santi Arias also being gone, they are down two wingbacks right now. Um, I sure he's a nice guy. I don't want to go into the season with Brett Halsey as a starter. I just don't think he can play at an MLS level consistently wow. for a starter. Wow. Um, <laughs> and man, like the will he won't be with Barrial, and then just clearing up his money and getting that infusion of of gam to do whatever they need to do with it. Yeah. I wish we, I it just, I'm with grace and I'm starting to worry now, not so much for Barrial, but for this team that they're not going to have enough time to get someone in, in this window or at least integrated into this team for the start of the year. I mean, the good news is if a deal for him does not materialize, you have Alvaro Barrial for half yeah, but of a do, season. But do you? That's the problem. Is that like, do you have Alvaro Barrial or do you have a frustrated Brenner type Alvaro Barrial where he's already got his eyes on the summer window? He's mad at the team for not making whatever deals were offered this go around. And it just turns into a toxic situation. I, I don't want that. I don't want to suggest that that is Alvaro. I've seen nothing at all from him anywhere or read anything about him or seen anything that would suggest he would behave that way. But if he did, I don't know that I'd be that mad at him. If this is like his dream and he wa he's wanted to do this since he first started playing and he's so close and it keeps being taken away from him, I don't even know that I would be mad at him beyond a, you know, you're hurting the team I like. But like as a human being, I'd be like, yeah, I get it, man. That sucks. Well so for that, I would say, at least with Brenner, there were offers on the table. Now, they weren't great offers for FC Cincinnati, but there were offers. There was a clear pathway out of FC Cincinnati. As far as I can tell, no offers are in for Barriel. And that's fine that he can be upset that he's 
stuck here. But unless a team is asking for him to play, his only way out of here is by playing very, very good and continuing the trajectory that he has been on. I I mean, yeah, it'd be one thing if, if I don't know, let's say a Bundesliga team offered us $4 million for him, right? And we turned it down because it wasn't, you know, near the target we were looking for. And then he's pissed. Now I buy it more. But I don't, I don't, as far as I can tell, nothing like that has happened yet. I think his agents, you know, drum, trying to drum up interest, which is why we're seeing these kind of, vague reports of yeah. interest from various teams. Um, maybe teams are thinking that they can wait FC Cincinnati out and get him, get him at a discount. Um, but, you know, I think like you saw with Brenner that there were specific offers that were reported by respectable journalists, right? That like, such and such team put this much on the table, right? Yeah. Or such and such team offered to loan him with a you know mandatory purchase option if they don't get relegated, you know? Yeah. And there's been nothing like that except for this fake Burnmouth thing. And um which tells me nothing's there because if something was there, the agent would have leaked it to someone at this point. If the, if he's trying, if he was trying to angle his way out, the agent would let it be known to reliable journalists. I think on this side of the Atlantic, that there was <laughs> yeah. there was something that was being concretely offered to FC Cincinnati that they were holding back on. And we know that there's we don't know the exact number, but we know there's a number. I think it's like what three that um, pays off Velez's sell on percentage while also making us enough of a profit to yeah. max out the gam. I forget what the exact it's somewhere in the neighborhood of two and a half to three. We, um, we start making money. Yeah. But, um, but there's also going to be an Albright number, which, you know, you, you want to get fair value right. for the players because it's not just about like, Oh, as long as I get my gam, I'm happy. It's like, you know, we're starting to we're starting to clear a profit or getting close to making money on on player sales versus transfer fees. I mean, I'm sure we're still we're still pretty seriously in the red <laughs> over it, but we, like we should go back and, and do the accounting <clears throat> on where FCC's balance is overall. It's but, not great. <laughs> but you know, but but between Brenner and Vasquez, yeah, right. That was a profit just on acquisition costs and sales for those two. Yep. And then you start to eat in the money you lost on a Tonga. They spent money on Angulo. You know, that could still pan out, but they spent Viacia money on... Viacia broke even. Yeah. yeah, they made... I think they actually... They did out pretty well on Viacia. Yeah. Because um, Colorado took over the rest of his transfer fee. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, well, they, they're spending transfer fees on, on Buja. Yeah. You know, and Albright is still Albright's going to want to keep spending transfer fees on players. And part of that is going to be showing ownership that this isn't just lost money and that there will be money coming in the door. So or trophies. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. So he's so like, I think it's perfectly fine to have a fair value target for Alvaro. And there's probably some. You know, there would be a there would be a number that would be like too high, and you'd start to wonder. You'd start to get a reputation of not moving guys onto onto Europe. But like, if if they're like, we don't want to get less than six for for Alvaro. I don't think anybody would have any right to complain. I would hope so not. then, Grayson. Let me ask you this one. Then let's assume that we get a perfectly happy. Barial, if this is the situation, he does come back for at the very least the first half of the 2024 season. Uh, and let's go ahead and say that there is a transfer fee, yeah, a six million dollar transfer fee waiting for him in the summer. Um, budget wise, roster build wise, is there anything that we should be concerned about with keeping Barial's 
salary this i i I assume his soon to be increased salary versus last year and how that might impact the roster this year i think he's gonna he's gonna be at i think a little above 600 um and the way i came to that number was i looked at his um salary his his base salary for last year mm-hmm. and then the guaranteed comp number that the union reported and the guaranteed comp number is an average of all years of the contract including option years yeah and so this year and next year are option years for Barrios contract which i assume would come with a significant um pay bump and there's probably an increase from this year to next year so i would say in the 600 range for his for his salary which is more but not i wouldn't think it would be you know very burdensome well, put it, to carry put it, put it this way i think that if you're if you're looking at it with barrial and roster build i would expect you'd have to pay about that much to get a barrial replacement well that's that's the other thing right is you it's a barrial replacement is probably they don't have a U twenty two spot, no. Mm-hmm. So a Barial replacement is probably going to be more expensive than Barial, either on a salary level or because you had to pay a transfer fee for that player. Um, I have not. I don't know what the out of contract left left wing back uh, market <laughs> looks like around the world. There's no Eric Lehigh um, hanging out somewhere, but like. <laughs> You know, they were linked to Palacios. I think there was also links to Kai Wagner. Mm-hmm. Um, either of those guys I, would be more expensive than Alvaro on a salary level. Gotcha. Um, and, so the salary yeah. is not a major concern then, at least in terms of it hampering a future deal. Obviously, bringing in a replacement and needing the GAM to do that is its own so thing, just, but there you wasn't take like a, a flyer poison. on like a really young player who might be cheap, but like right. that that player is going to take like Alvaro wasn't Alvaro when he came over at nineteen, no, right? No. Like it took him a little bit of time to yeah so to me, to jump. Let me throw this out there: is the fact that we were linked to Kai Wagner didn't close the deal? We were linked to Palacios didn't close the deal. Is that an indication they think a Barrial deal isn't getting done this window? I think it's hard to replace Barrial without a deal oh, being done. Without a replacement, yeah. And um, if you sign his replacement... Oh, pressure's on. But he's still on the <laughs> roster. Teams are going to know that you have to move him. Yeah. Right? And they know like- that you need to move him more than they need him for a particular transfer fee. Yeah, it's not as obvious, but it's like when uh, MLS teams will get caught sometimes with four DPs on their roster before roster compliance day. It's like one of these has to go and you are you aren't getting shit for one of them. So, yeah, they they know you've got to uh, remove that player from your roster. Well, on the note of a Barrio replacement, uh, rumors out there that we found, as far as I can tell, a clone of Alvaro Barrial playing in Brazil. Argentinian, uh, who came up from the same academy as Barrial, were teammates for at least one season, uh, more in the academy, uh, an attacking winger who could play on both sides. Uh, I think plays as an inverted winger on the right side, so he's left-footed but plays on the right side of the attack. Um, If you were to try to find... A Barrio replacement in world soccer, in that you were looking for a player that looked like Barrio. This is the exact guy you'd be looking at. So I, I have to admit, I don't have his name in front of me. I'm hoping you do, Grayson. Tell, tell me a little bit about this guy. Um, it's uh, Luca Oriano. That's it, Luca. He came up in the Velez Academy, which is the same as alvaro they never, they're about the same age they never played together with the first mm, team but okay. they were on they've never been seen in the same room together <laughs> they were on a couple of uh they were on a couple of benches together okay um tiago almada was also a velez guy and um oriano and almada seemed to know each other 
Um, nice. He's he's a very left footed player. Um, I'm not sh- exactly sure why he's not playing a lot for Vasco da Gama. I tried to figure it out and I couldn't find anything in English and I didn't know what to search in Brazilian. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> but he, he plays primarily as an inverted right winger, which so he's like, you know, would cut in on his left foot, which we saw Barial play a lot at, yeah. early in his time here. Um, but yeah, he I mean he's a guy who takes corners, takes free kicks, plays a plays a pretty nice cross with his with his left foot. Um, How's he with his right? I saw him in the clips. I saw I saw him use it a little bit <laughs> to run or to play soccer with. So, like, <laughs> like he did occasionally touch the ball with his right foot, but he did seem to go out of his way to keep it on his left, like as often as he could. And would even like does that a lot of players, you know, end up with their body contorted in kind of funny ways just yeah. to keep the ball on their strong foot. Um, he, yeah. he scored, so he's not with Vasco's first team currently they're training in, in Uruguay. Mm, um, okay. but he played with, I guess like a mostly reserve team in like the Rio cup. Yeah. Uh, the state today. Championships. Yeah. yeah. And they played against the third, third tier Brazilian team. And he had a, you know, Golazo. uh, and also uh, got an assist off of a free kick. Nice. Quick, um, buy him before the price goes up. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, but uh, he's what? What they're and oh, and the other thing is, um, he's he's kind of a dribbly boy too. I like that. And I, I you, there's a lot of a lot more highlights of him taking taking guys on and making longer dribbly runs that we haven't we don't see a lot from. We get, um, get some videos. Some, get some videos. Some stackovers. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, so he Vasco bought him for three million. Okay. Uh, about a year ago, and I think it looks like they're just looking for somebody to offload him and take his salary. Yeah, which, which is weird. It looks like it's a little less than five hundred k. Yeah. Uh, the president of Velez the club um, said that that they were not able to bring him back because Vasco wants someone to take his whole salary and it's too expensive for them. Mm-hmm. So um, it we looks like here is tribute. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, it looks like they're looking for a loan type situation and, you know, we've, we've been linked to him in like fairly large Argentina, or Brazilian accounts and Argentine accounts for a couple of weeks. And the other teams that I've seen linked with him are, uh, uh, Talaris in Argentina and then a club in, in Ecuador that there's no yeah. way they're paying his salary and certainly not a transfer fee. Yeah. Um, but given that Vasco paid a transfer fee for him, just a year ago of like $3 million. We, we can't carry like a significant transfer fee on our, on our budget this year. So he would have to be a loan. I mean, I think he would have to be a loan situation with, you know, maybe some type of purchase option after the season, because, you know, like OB doesn't, doesn't need to be a DP next year. Right. Yeah. I also do wonder a little bit, I said this online, maybe on the Discord, that there have been a couple of rumors about FC Cincinnati ticking the tires on players that clearly don't fit our budget. Like Origi? Yeah, like Origi. So some of this, I, I'm willing to bet that we're being linked to players, and this is just part and parcel to the click to translate season, that we're being linked to players because we were the number one team in MLS last year, and agents who, you know, need a team to link an MLS, we may as well put the uh, the top of the table team, the <clears throat> the champions of MLS in any other um, league format. And, you know, the fact that we don't have the budget space for them and legally can't uh, comply with roster rules to sign them, be damned. I also don't wonder a little bit, and this is kind of dark, but, you know, hey, 
um, if Albright wasn't making some contingency plans in case Aaron Bupenza's situation made it so that he would not be a member of the FC Cincinnati organization for this year. And maybe, you know, you're always prepared for things. Maybe there was a little bit of preparation of, oh, okay, well, if I find myself suddenly with a DP spot, what can I do with that? Yeah. Sure. But I think it's way more of option A of that, like, we're being linked to players now because agents can use it to gas the value by saying the top team in MLS is looking at them. Yeah, yeah. they linked us to, I saw us linked to uh, Jackson Mendez, who used to play for Orlando and LAFC, and mm-hmm. now he's down in Brazil, I think. Yeah. I don't really see that one because he's a midfielder. We're already getting a little crowded. Yeah. At midfield. And I can't imagine that like they would be spending the kind of money it would take to bring him over on yet another midfielder. Yeah. Assuming we're playing with a three man midfield, you have Lucho and Obi as your DPs. They're nailed on. And then some combination of Bucha and Gulo, you still have Pinto Kubo. there. Kubo. And yeah, and Kubo is there. So that's you're too deep basically at every position. Add in, you're still expecting a couple of these youngsters, uh, like uh Dado and even uh Jimenez to step up at some point. They were getting brief appearances in cup games. So yeah, like the idea that we would spend a transfer free to bring in yet another midfielder, Don't I'm not it. buying it. Especially not with potentially two wing backs and a striker left to fill. Yeah on the depth chart right now, and that's that's the big thing is yeah the wingbacks and the striker now if you offer me <laughs> bariel's clone on loan for four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year for the season yeah yeah that that one tracks that one i i could believe so long as he's cool with playing wingback either on the left or right side there um and it does look like, I mean, speaking of Brazil, speaking of wingbacks, Santi Arias, there's a rumor out there now. He is off to uh, a club in Brazil. So, Bahia. Yeah, the uh, the city. <laughs> city, fo- city football group team in yeah. Brazil, yeah. Which, yeah. Uh, um, but good for him if that ends Again, up being Yeah, it's the a case. rumor. Um, but yeah, the, it's a rumor out there. It's just more smoke that he's not coming back. I don't know if that door is completely closed, but I'm sure he's kicking the tires on a couple of other ones. I don't wonder if bringing Arias back isn't contingent on getting, it would be on a one year deal and isn't contingent on getting that gam from, or bringing Arias back isn't contingent on that Barreal deal getting done and having the infusion of gam that you can buy a one year contract down on. That would be interesting. I could see something like that, or even, I don't know. If you can't find anything, Arius, we'll be here with this offer. See if you can't well, match it. Elsewhere. They're also thinking like, how much? Because I'm, I'm pretty confident they're still looking for a starting striker. Mm-hmm. And so you know that's another thing you got to allocate a certain amount of resources to. Yeah. And without Barial going out, you don't know how much, how much resources you have to work with and like once you so there's a lot of moving pieces yeah yeah uh no rumors that i've seen or anything substantial on a starting striker that always feels felt like i should say or it feels like a uh an mls move i feel like we'd be in for an mls striker to take that starting spot i think the exact opposite i think they got their i think they got their mls striker with Corey baird and i think Mm. that you're gonna i think you'll want if it's me, you want a balance of guys on your team that are MLS people and people that are, you know, have a little bit of a higher ceiling of performance than your average MLS player with one person. You have two people in the strikers room right now that are MLS guys with Santos and Baird. If mm. I'm guessing, I'm guessing they're going out of MLS for that second, that starting striker. That's a good point. I was thinking generally of the starting 11, but when you break it down to just the strikers, that, that actually makes a lot of sense. What about like free agent Gustavo Bo? Ooh. Wouldn't hate it. But as your starter? Yeah, right. I, yeah. Does, yeah. Does, he, does he have it still? 
you offer them the uh, the no turf <laughs> discount, right? Does yeah. he? <laughs> um, also out there, just uh, you know, the last little last little glimmer of hope gone. Uh, Yersa Mosquera officially loaned out to Villarreal. Um, was kind of looking forward to him being a Premier League player and just kind of tracking that but uh off to uh off to spain see how that plays out for him but obviously it's it's a big step up for him step up uh does well for his national team you know development if if that's a main concern there Uh, he's not going to end up on the bench somewhere for a long time no it's it's a good move overall for him um and yeah here's the hope and wolves stay up and and we don't have a premier league year some mascara next year that loss has always felt a little hard, a little easier to take just because Miles Robinson signed so early in the window yeah, where it was yeah. like, all right, we, we got that covered. <laughs> it was nice having Yerson here, miss him, but the back line's going to be fine without him, I feel. Yeah, that is certainly a position of strength uh, this year. Not that it wasn't last year, but I feel more confident in the depth generally. I, I don't feel worse about it. Yes. We'll put it that I, way. Feel, I feel a little bit better about it because I... You were the main critic of the depth, and you were right in at the end of the season. You were a hundred percent right. So I think I think Kip Keller uh helps your helps your depth. Mm-hmm. And then I think Miles Robinson is a um upgrade to uh I think I think I think Miles is an upgrade, especially if he finds his form. Yeah. Uh he's an upgrade over over Yearson. Yeah. I agree. Not necessarily uh, forever, but for right now, for twenty twenty four, for today, yeah. I mean, if you were to listen to U.S. Men's National Team Twitter, uh, Miles Robinson should have been a Premier League player. So you know they're they're basically neck and neck. Um, and to round out the depth there, uh, FC Cincinnati two has signed what looked like a brand new team, as far as well, I that's, can tell. That's that's good because <laughs> the team they had wasn't exactly cutting it. Yeah, not not great. Uh, the one that caught my eye uh, again, don't have his name in front of me, but uh, he was or at least had been New York City FC's captain of their two team. Uh, I, I don't know much about MLS next. Pro, but I feel like when you're poaching other teams' captains, your floor is being raised. So that feels uh, generally like a good move there. Uh, it did look like there was a mixture of USL guys getting this opportunity. Uh, it looked like a handful of international players, and then yeah, a lot of domestic MLS Next Pro talent just sort of shuffling around in that league. So yeah, maybe we'll do a maybe we'll do a segment on them down the line. I. Yeah, don't pay. I don't pay super close attention to. But I like that we're acknowledging FCC it. Too, I like that we're acknowledging it happened. Yeah, yeah. Not, and they, not a they single player need... to be named, but we're acknowledging it's happening. <laughs> and you know, this is a team that was not good last year, or the and year before, <laughs> or any year. And if you want the first team to thrive, part of that is going to have to be like you know for long-term sustainability part of that's going to have to be finding contributors from your academy and from the two team yeah that you know we, we've said this before that the sales pitch to to newton albright or with newton albright was you get to recreate philadelphia but you get a bigger budget you have an owner willing to spend and a big part of philadelphia's success was yes finding gems in eastern europe and you know, lower lower leagues that nobody else was paying attention to but then maybe primarily the development of their youth academy and their youth system um so philadelphia obviously a massive metro area they were able to pull from a large uh group of players but <laughs> mls has loosened up a lot of those rules and you're starting to see more and more of that uh a lot of academy movement. Uh, we poached another one uh, from New York Red Bulls Academy recently uh, on the lower, uh, you know, lower down into the academy system. So, hopefully, the name you were, look- that- the, the name you were looking for was Nico Benalcazar. I I think he was the protagonist of Grand Theft Auto Four. So there you go. That's it's your cousin Roman. Let's go bowling. Twenty-two-year-old <laughs> uh, defender spent the last two seasons at NYCFC, uh, where he was a homegrown player. Oh, there look you at go. Us. He was the team leader in 2022 in interceptions. In 2023, he made 12 appearances and scored three goals from the back line. 
projects it- as a OB esque player. There I like you go. This. Former Demon Deacon <laughs> from Wake Forest University. We love our college oh, players. Of course, we got a Wake yeah. Forest guy. Yeah, you think? <laughs> USLFCC was essentially Wake Forest alumni, uh, at, you know, the soccer tournament uh, version. So there we go. Um, cool. The, I, that wraps us. I don't know. Do we have anything else, FCC, that people want to? dive into before we we head on over to the film room let's predictions from the two of you by the time we tape this and drop this episode next monday will we have a new signing that's question one and question two will alvaro Barrial still be a member of fc cincinnati by the time we drop this episode tomorrow by the time we drop the next, by the time we drop the next episode, oh, on the next 29th. episode, yeah, on the 29th, a week from now, Albright's got to move quick. I know, right? Wake up, let's go. I would say yes to yes to yes to having a new signing by then, and yes Ooh. to Barrial still being an FC Cincinnati player. Ooh. That's where I was down, leaning as down well. Down to the wire, I'll say yeah. yes. I think I think Barrial gets sold, and I think uh, Bucha. At least Bucha gets uh, gets announced. Oh, that doesn't count. No, I mean another new signing. Yeah, oh, Bucha. damn it! Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I thought... then I was, I'll still say yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. Vibes high. Bring it in. We 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 love all of our new players. Uh, so there you go. There's your FCC wrap up. Uh, let's head on over to part three. Cause boy, I've got some takes. Let's go. <laughs> We're going into the film room. We saw rebel moon. Let's let's go. All right. We're back. We're safely clear of soccer. We've, we've fulfilled our quota of soccer content. Uh, and to be clear, your Patreon subscription will not entitle you to more soccer content. Yeah, no, honestly, it encourages us to do less. To do less. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in the film room, we, uh, we added this one. Uh, Chief, I believe this was your suggestion. Even back in December, uh, yeah. this was your suggestion. Uh, Rebel Moon, the, uh, the latest and greatest from visionary director. Zack Schneider, I think it is legally required to be introduced that way on the trailer. Uh, this was his epic sci-fi. This was his sci-fi uh, movie, all original as far as I can tell. We can oh, touch well, on that. Yeah. We, we can touch that. on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, his, it's his sci-fi um, space opera opus. Yes, yes. It is more than just that, though. Oh, um, talk to me. Looking at the uh, just some some things in here, it's intended to be part of a, fl- a franchise. They already no, have course. part two that is set to be released on April nineteenth. Which, um, to be clear, part one and part two are the first film as they're imagining it of right. an eventual projection. So yeah. yes, it, the the part two is not the project. Right, it's I think the subsequent film. Yeah, the movie's I mean, not over. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's. A, I think the movie is four parts. I think it's already. He got signed to a four. He was approved cool. for a four picture deal on this. Bring it on. Um, part three is being work was being worked on the script as of December. Um, <laughs> was that's probably good. Snyder's exact uh, series length plans are unclear, having stated the film is intended to be the first in a trilogy, but said it would be followed by a trilogy of sequels <laughs> involving potentially up to six films total. Um, Snyder has He's stated that just intent- speed running Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, we're just- no, it gets better. Snyder has stated that his intent is for Rebel Moon to be uh, become, quote, a massive IP in a universe that can be built out, unquote. You a can't... role-playing video game based on Rebel Moon was in development as of March 2023, <sighs> alongside an animated short and a graphic novel. There's been Jesus a novelization Christ. of the film already written, and it's been announced that there's a four-player co-op action game that will be available exclusively on the Netform ga- Netflix game platform. When's the uh, when's the theme park opening? Evil Thank Genius God. Games uh, has a deal to produce a tabletop role playing game set in the Rebel Moon universe. There's a comic book deal, um, and apparently there's a podcast that's going to be coming out about this too. So. <gasps> Thank God there's a podcast. I was so, worried. So no, it is. This is it's just... every man's right to have a podcast. <laughs> right. Like, I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk that down. <laughs> no, no. All podcasts matter. That's rule number one. So no, this is this is if you had to put an idea in this that um, Disney Plus has Star Wars and the mm-hmm. Marvel Cinematic Universe. 
Paramount has Star Trek and their endless attempts to make shows that don't understand fundamentally what Star Trek is all about. Mm -hmm. And this is, I guess, Netflix thinking, I, we need our IP that is this big genre-based original property. Since Whoa, we hang don't... on, hang on. Apple has foundation. Don't Apple leave, out. Okay. Don't leave a out the little guys. <laughs> Apple has foundation, silo for all mankind. All it's got the, mo the, the monsters, the Godzilla show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're doing okay. So this is Netflix's attempt, because Netflix really, like, when it comes to, like, sci-fi and this kind of genre stuff, Netflix has a lot of, like, real bad swings and misses, which... Yeah we'll get into about whether or not this falls into that. But like they try to keep adapting like anime to live action. Do you remember yeah. Bright? I was just thinking oh, of Bright. <coughs> the man. Will Smith, uh, the zombie movie, not zombie, fairy, the monster. Fairy there. lives don't matter today. <laughs> I uh, think it was a race allegory. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah. Yeah, the ham fisted. Orcs, orcs are Latinos. <laughs> like, it was awful. It was really bad. No, it's one of the worst. Like that would be another movie that would be a lot of fun to talk about because it's 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 trying so hard. To Speaking of the guy who wrote that, put a tweet out about the. He didn't name it in the tweet, but he was like, he was like, it's crazy to like finish a script and you're looking at it and you realize if made the right way, this could be my Star Wars. <laughs> oh, no. no. <laughs> Well, oh. I guess they didn't make it the right way. No, they did I not. I guess not. <laughs> but yes, Netflix, uh, a choppy history, we'll say. And I say this as someone that actually enjoyed the live action remake of Cowboy Bebop, as sacrilegious <laughs> as that is to some. So yes, the, here we find ourselves with Rebel Moon. It released back in December. And um, where do we want to start on this one? Okay, <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, two, two, I, I, I guess two things to kick us off. Please. One is when when I saw the reaction to this movie, and we talked about this on our on our episode. Um, it was like, what could possibly be so bad about this movie that it's getting this like violent negative reaction? Right. And because people, it felt like people were go falling all over themselves to yeah. say the meanest possible thing about the movie that they could. Yeah, some of the written reviews like, were brutal. And I'm like, everyone we've looking walked to get a into, dunk off. I, I, it just felt like we had walked into some weird culture war thing that I didn't quite understand. Mm -hmm. And what I think it came down to is that there's a portion of the internet that somehow latched onto Zack Snyder as their like anti woke hero. OK. And I don't know what came first was like, quote unquote, woke people didn't like Zack Snyder or the anti woke people latched onto him, which which caused a, um, you know, a equal and opposite reaction. And because there's a lot of like, if you looked up the movie at the time, yeah. uh, you looked up like Rebel Moon, like woke. You can find a lot of people being like. Oh, I loved Rebel Moon, and it's not any of this woke stuff. <laughs> and I, how would you? Uh, okay. And I hate to tell sure. you this. I hate to tell you this. Um, the movie is woke. It's pretty woke, folks. It's pretty woke. Um, and getting into, I guess, I, I made a list of things that I appreciated about Rebel Moon. And I'd like to just go off the list really quickly. Okay. Because I think we're going to not, not gonna say well a lot of nice movie. things yeah. <laughs> after this. Okay. And one of the things I wrote was that the movie was woke. Okay. Um, yeah. There was this, in particular, there was this scene where like this, that could have been like a throwaway scene and like any, certainly would not have gotten the care that this scene got from Zack Snyder, mm -hmm. where this character has to kill this giant spider. Yeah. And like the giant spider is given like this like whole like anti-colonial speech yeah. about like how her actions are justified. And also, I actually thought it was pro-environmentalism pro too. Yeah. That like it was the I, pollution that was causing her children to be to die. Yeah. yeah. 
And I thought that I thought it was actually really good. I was like, I was like, you know, this movie cared enough about this little thing to like take this cartoonishly evil looking villain. Right. Yeah. And imbue her with some with some with some humanity and make this our heroes killing of her kind of a morally gray yeah. act, which I thought was like, cool. Um, Probably that, could have spent any of that effort filling out the backstory for the bad guys, <laughs> but continue. Yeah. <laughs> um, I liked that it was not a trauma plot that like characters had backstory that they had experienced traumas, but it's just like how say, they got flirted with it. At times. But, it's, yeah. but, but the way that trauma played into the plot is it just explains like, how the characters got to where they were in their lives. Right, right. That's the key it word wasn't this like movie the whole... explains. This movie yeah. explains. Um, I liked, I appreciated the movie took itself seriously by like... <laughs> yes, it not... took itself very, yeah. very seriously. So like the dramatic moments and stuff were not constantly undercut by like one-liners and yeah. meta no. commentary and like, oh, well, that happened. Right. This yeah. the, you know, type like my, stuff. Like the one note I wrote down watching this is that this is very much a re, it's not a rebuke of wokeism. It's a wo rebuke of like Whedonism, where yes. like this yes. is the anti Joss Whedon. Where she, yeah. she smelled dirt unironically. Like, yeah. We're, yeah, yeah, we're in it. Right. And and there <laughs> were there were gunfights where no one looks over their shoulder to, to crack wise at their colleague fighting at the same time. Shocking. Just in modern movies, like that level of we're taking this, we're playing this so deadly serious. Honestly, slightly refreshing in a weird sort of way. Uh, for a, a, for bit, a little bit. Yeah, continue, okay, continue, go ahead. Go ahead. Continue. Um, so I thought that I thought it was I thought it was there was an attempt, a, a valiant attempt to like build a universe with not just like labeled evil people and good people, but like of people that have kind of clear competing interests and motivations. You thought there were clear interests? No, no. Well, <laughs> yeah, like like in the sense that like people acted like out of self, like people acted out of like self-interest yeah. and like motivation yep. versus just okay. like this is the bad guy and this is the good guy. Right, like cuz like where I where I had some hope for this movie when we when I started watching it, was that so it starts off with our heroine, I guess, on a planet orbiting way too close to a gas giant for it to be healthy. I mean a little close. Little close. Um I know what that does in terms of radiation. It's gonna fry you every single time. <laughs> but she's in this farming village where we learn as part of one of the many info dumps in this movie, she had crashed a spaceship uh, and had been rescued by one of the residents. Mm -hmm. And what I was kind of enjoying a little bit is the fact that when the evil empire uh, comes to this village, A, they're not looking for her. There isn't immediately like a savior or a, oh, this is the person that we're out hunting. You're hiding the fugitive from us. And also, we're kind of okay not being heroic. Like, we're not taking sides. We've sold... We're just in it to get along. We don't care about the Empire. We don't care about this other thing. Um, playing into this idea of like, oh, maybe there's going to be a little bit of nuance to what's going on in this movie. And nope. <laughs> it's yet another movie where um, and another sci-fi. And I don't. All right. So I know it's a tr it's a joke now and it's like a meme. Like, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? Yes. I don't, I don't, when. When in popular sci-fi did like we just start using Rome as like we need to create a villain in this story. We're just going to make them space Romans. Right. Like, well, he was space Nazis. I, I, I was going to say I spent the entire movie I watched most of it with my wife. I would just nudge her and go, get it. It's like the Nazis. No, like I didn't think it was, they, all had, they all had Roman names. It was all like Titus and Atticus. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. The but Imperium. The one guy looked like the main villain looked like M. Bison with Raul Julia playing it from Street Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> like a comically um, evil looking dude. Oh, my gosh. I don't uh, know. It's it, it's. Some of these, some of these things aren't 
aren't aren't aren't really worth it. But uh, I guess what I'll what I'll close on is uh, it had both Dario and Harris's in it. <laughs> I mean, that's if you remember the show Game of Thrones, there's yeah. a character show, yeah. named Dario Naharis who um, kind of just without explanation, the actor that played him changed. Uh, and this movie had both of those actors in it. One was uh, her boyfriend and the other one was the main villain. It was good. Right. So this movie. Um... God, there's so much I want to talk about. I don't know how to start. All right, let's start here. What was the point of Anthony Hopkins' robot? No idea. Dude, I, I, I thought that was going to be a really big plot point. <laughs> Should that, have like, been. That they, oh, number one, just when it was Anthony Hopkins was the person voicing it. I was like, okay. And like, they kind of fuck around with the robot, shooting it with guns, saying, ah, they're nonviolent now. They won't do anything. And then it just sort of disappears for the remainder of the film. No, literally ran away. And that was the last we ever yeah, saw right. it. <laughs> like, I was, I was you know interested in what was going on there and there was just there was just nothing it just doesn't doesn't happen I, um ugh. why is everything in slow motion in this movie there is oh so much God. slow motion in this movie my like, favorite part is when the style sl- the slow-mo goes slow-mo that's my favorite i love when we've got to we got to time dilate even more right because the slow-mo has a dramatic moment within it i right. full max pain like i just it was it got it was jarring how often yeah. things went to slow-mo. Sometimes the action went slow-mo, but other times just like people walking went to slow-mo for no... Or would no... be slow-mo for too long. Like, I don't mind it, yeah, like, when used tastefully in an action scene, but like, she slams her wall, or her, her body against the wall to take cover. It's like, show that at full speed. Like, you're taking all of the, the oomph out of the action by slowing it down. Like... So so there was that. And then it was, God, there were too many info dumps in this movie. Like, it, yeah. it, I understand good writing is show, don't tell. This this film was like, but what if that wasn't good advice? <laughs> what if we just did a lot of telling and very little showing? Like, we learn everything about this. Like, the main character is very mysterious for the first, like, you know, 15, 20 minutes of this movie. Yeah. And then immediately ceases being mysterious. Because sitting around a campfire, she just tells her life story to this dude. Everything. And it's like, oh, okay, that's who she is. I don't need to. I know everything I need to know about her now at this point. There is no, nothing of interest left to be revealed about this character. Yeah, it's just, it, it was, it's the whole thing. I should say, like, overall, like, just big picture stuff, like, uh, was there an original idea introduced in this film plot story-wise even character was no they any... did so they did the star wars cantina scene like um, almost like all... beat for beat yeah. like <laughs> get in a fight everybody resumes their drinks like what yeah the fuck they did the star wars cantina scene um then after they do the cantina scene they meet with the they meet at the they meet with the smuggler mm-hmm. at the cantina who offers him a ship off world Wow. I don't know if I don't know if I've heard that story before. Well, the, but, the young then, farmer had never been off world too, so right. he was a little thrown off. Yeah, right. that's good. Um and then they go on a series of adventures that felt like I want to write this scene into a movie. I don't really have a great reason to. And oh. so it was under the guise of we're recruiting people for our army to fight back. Which is not, the Imperium. oh my God, I'm so mad about the whole right. plot, and it's like, but yes. And it's like, you're not really recruiting an army, you're recruiting individual people. A dude. A dude. A dude to fight against the space Roman Nazis. Like, and, oh, by the way, you were just in a cantina in a shootout with a bunch of bad guys and mercenaries. Hire them? What the right. fuck? Well, <laughs> so, they never had the opportunity to do that. Oh, right. excuse they were, me. They they go on they go on a series of adventures. Yes. And um like the first one they go on, it's just like a knockoff of Avatar, where they go yes. to this planet and there's a dude there for some reason who I guess is like an indentured servant, like he owes work to this guy. And the guy says, Oh, you can have him if he manages to ride this winged creature. But if he doesn't do it, you'll all be servants too to which if it's me and like i'm trying to i'm trying to free a planet it's like all right deuces man i'm not taking that bet 
Like, oh, um, oh, you're you're not trying to free a planet. You're trying to protect a village of twenty people. Of twenty Continue. people, of like a far, like a farmland. Just, like, to stop, it, oh my god! Continue. To stop them, not even to free them, to stop them from having all their food stolen. Like they can still Some leave. Of their they food can, <laughs> right. So we get. Well, this they can't ex- leave because it's like I couldn't tell what they're supposed to be. If they're supposed to be like space Amish or like the right wing memed like South African farmers or <laughs> what? Because like the, the accents that like Corey Stoll especially chose yeah. to do was just like kind of incomprehensible. They they yeah. look like, like they look like space Irish. I actually made a note of this: is that whenever you need to like make people look poor, you just make them space Irish because they're playing <laughs> fiddles and doing jigs and shit like that. But Charlie um, Hunnam was Space Irish, right? Yeah. Yes. So we do the knockoff avatar scene where the guy wrestles a hippogriff or it's like Harry Potter, too. <laughs> yeah. He wrestles a hippogriff and then takes it on a flight and breaks it over the course of flying. And then they leave him. Then they go to the planet that's like not Coruscant and go down to the slums and they fight the arachnid queen. That is definitely not the Rachni queen from Mass Effect. <laughs> oh, I thought she looked. I thought she looked like the Borg queen. To be honest, the, it was in a combination: the, the Borg queen, the Rachni queen from Mass Effect, and then the uh, Spider Queen from the second season of Doctor Who um, Christmas special. Dead on. Look it up if you don't. Um, it's the same fucking CGI. Um, <laughs> so they fight her, and they've got like you know what? She gives a touching soliloquy about colonialism pollution and it's like at the end of this they have recruited two people like they've t- yeah. they've spent 40 minutes of this movie to add two people to their fighting group one I, I, one guy speaks to animals so that'll be useful and then the the other one is pretty good with swords which yeah. again will be great when the uh but like the they're, bunch they're, of soldiers show up with guns they're glowing swords that cut into people that by, is yeah, useful you know a you know we're not gonna <laughs> we're legally not allowed to call them lightsabers for the purposes of this but that is and then, good then they finally get somewhere where they can recruit some actual people and even after they do that only like 10 people decide to go with of the army that this rebel leader has only 10 of his dudes decide we're going to go back and save the village. And then they have the fight right there and never actually save the fucking vi- They never actually go to the village to have a fight. Like The, the village dies <laughs> at some point throughout this movie and we will never see it. They're all dead. They, they, they send one radio communication. Hey, how's, how's the harvest going down there? And they don't hear anything back. And there is just one bomb launched from, from low earth orbit. And that village is gone. I, this is what kills me. The stakes of this movie were non-existent. 12 bushels of wheat from one village were the stakes. And the one girl was so upset by that, that she was going to recruit an army to defend it. Like, they yeah, all she, could have she, just walked I, to the big town. Those stakes are fine. That, those is are perfect, terrible stakes. It is perfectly fine to be like the right of the people in this village to live freely is worth fighting for. And but like a that's, whole you can do that where in an a whole, admiral walks you can into do the that, village. You can do that <laughs> in a you can do that in a very like like personal stakes are real. Like one of my pet peeves is people have this idea in their head, which is a fucking brain dead idea that stakes depend on like the number of people who who might die or based sure. on oh it's got to be like the planet right the planet blowing up is the biggest right. stake so we're just going to do the planet blowing up that's what the problem with marvel movies is it's stakes creep where it's like the fate of the planet yeah. is at stake well now it's the fate of the universe and after the fate of the universe it's the multiverse and eventually we're just going to run out of ways to raise the stakes in movies I, i'm i get I'm that the, fine with the that. stakes of like the stakes in like the dark knight it's really just like a philosophical argument. I'm know, fine. Of like, I'm fine with that. You but- know, and and the stakes for this could have been fine. Like, I think, I think seven samurai in space is a good idea for a movie. Star Wars killed it. <laughs> yeah, it was so. Star Wars, uh, Star Wars was uh, Dark Fortress. Sure. Um, but like all the best. So, which it's also like kind of a kind of killed me that people were like, oh, this. This rips off Star Wars. Star Wars, uh, everything right. good in Star Wars is ripping off something else, yes. which is perfectly fine. Right. Um, Seven Samurai, Magnificent Seven, both really good movies. Battle those movies, those yeah. movies were ripped off by uh, 
uh, or at least they're spoofed by like the three amigos, a bug's life, a galaxy quest, all the same yeah. plot, you know, all successful movies to different, different degrees. Um, like I think galaxy quest is great and it feels like wholly original, but the plot, you can't like all the elements are like ripped off from other things. Uh, when the Mandalorian was good, it was because it was just riffing on like old Western and yeah. samurai stories on like yes. individual episodes. And when they tried to like build out the universe and stuff, it started started uh, sucking. Yeah, it, lost, it lost what made it um, good when they stopped making it just, you know, cow, a gunslinger rides into town every week. Ro- right. Rogue One was, you know, like Dirty Dozen or or Guns of Navarone. Um you know, kind of there's a lot of movies that had that same formula, which is which is, you know, kind of similar to the formula for for this movie. So, like, I think Seven Samurai in space is a cool and good idea. And I think it's fine if it's like we're going to we're going to we're going to save this town because, you know, we're the only ones who can and will can work. It's just. This movie was boring and incompetent and weird, <laughs> like in weird, like not in a good way. Right. Like weird guess, in a. So so let me let me defend my my stakes argument here, which is they put too much weight on the bad guy's side of the equation. If it was a, you know, a low commander trying to feed his platoon of a hundred guys and they needed wheat. And so they got pissed off that they want to mount a small defense. That's fine. They had a goddamn processional with the honor guard and a high ranking admiral that apparently has a afterlife connection to the slain leader. Uh, Like they went like the highest of highs, a full dreadnought is sitting in orbit to the point where it terrorizes the citizens. Like it levels a planet. One village. Yeah, it right. levels a planet later in the movie. Like right. again, I agree. I agree with that. Vill- it was it was too imbalanced. If like it, it was a been- city on the other side and not the village, I buy it more. But like, and then if I'm the rebels and you threaten our entire existence to save a village of twenty people from having to give up twelve bushels of wheat. I would have murdered them right then and there. What, you are a security risk. I owe you nothing. You are ruining everything. Well, Get think, away from me. I think what part of what the problem was is that, that that you can even make the stakes imbalance work, but you've got to acknowledge it in the movie. Someone has to say, like, why are we doing this? Going up against this unbelievable force like this, we have no chance. They have they could nuke the site from orbit. Why? Like, we're, there's five of us. One guy talks to animals. The other can only stab people. How is that going to work? Like, you have to at least acknowledge that. But in this entire movie, it's like, no, no. If we just recruit these five people, we can take the dreadnought down. You do have to explain why you either can only find a small team. Right. Or why a small (gasps) team is, like, uniquely able to pull this to pull this off, right? Like even right. like the original Star Wars takes a couple of seconds to explain why they're doing these like small fighters up against the Death Star. Right. 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 They 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 care enough about about it making sense to like contrive a reason why we're gonna do a dog fight over this right over this thing. There's a character right? like incredulous at the idea. Like you know, what good are snub fighters going to do against that? It's like, just like your plan is bullshit. It's like, no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. It, it works for the story. You're going to like the visuals. Trust me. Yeah. But like, but this movie, right. they and never, that's why they did it. Cause they, cause that's the coolest scene you could do. They just have to explain why this is the scene we're going to do. Right. Right. <laughs> but this movie, it never, it never does that. It never, it never answers a lot of really basic questions. Like it, it, it info dumps, but it doesn't answer the question of what are these 10 people that don't like wearing shirts and are for some reason really dirty. Like, like I understand the idea of the lived in future. That was kind of Star Wars' big thing. Yeah. I'm guessing showers exist, <laughs> but like everyone in this movie looks filthy. Um, so what are these people going to do to combat this admiral and his dreadnought? Number two, what's the plan after they're mad that you blow their dreadnought up? Like, <laughs> right. Like, right. 
<laughs> is this going to like is the goal to spark some kind of a revolution are we doing anything are the villagers cool that you're gonna put all this heat on them because it it very much felt like most of them weren't <laughs> right not a single person wanted to fight like not, not, the will of the people was against fighting back whatsoever and then yeah like you you did the bad thing in the sense of like you've killed all of the soldiers in the city and then you immediately left and i just kept thinking like the rest of them should probably get their ass out of there too that that shit is toast baby yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you, you've got and you recruit you recruit a dude that a woman that uh, that or she fights with swords that are glowing we recruit another dude who can talk to animals and and lasso hippogriffs and then a general who they 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 give this guy a bath he's the only person in this movie where they actually try to wash somebody <laughs> and they dump a bunch of buckets of water on him he's, and he's still like, dirty after yeah. the bath but yes. and it's like well he's a general Okay, is he commanding anyone? Like, right? Yeah. Look, Who's he look, commanding? If I was trying to, ten commandos. Right, like, if I was trying to like take Fallujah, I wouldn't bring Colin Powell. Like, I'd bring some dudes with an AK forty-seven. You know, like, we've got Colin Powell and a couple of militia guys from yeah, up in the Michigan. Five, <laughs> yeah, the five-star generals aren't liberating the town. Like. <laughs> also his recruitment was hilarious you should do this i don't want to no you really should all right <laughs> you think of the men think of the men that died in your command like the all conversation right, was <laughs> almost that long like it was <laughs> yeah like and nobody's being paid like to, as best i can tell i don't understand why anyone joins this little this little recruitment to go back and fight for some farming town on the outskirts of nowhere like if you changed it to like they are mining a rare resource and for whatever reason, they're the only people that can mine this and nobody else can even get near it. And they're being threatened by the big baddies. Now, all of a sudden it all makes sense, but yeah, no, that's, you've, you've made it too open. I and like, know. The, it, you know, it, in the space Roman Nazis, it's, I guess we th were to think they're bad because they're mean to these villagers, but like, again, and, he, and that's a criticism of star Wars too, that actually like George worked way too hard to solve in the prequels but like i don't really know what the bad guys stand for but i can kind of vaguely understand like monarchy trying to expand i really have no idea what the rebels are trying to do especially when they apparently also have a king so now like i don't really see them as being good guys inherently so yeah, like what's that what's that the, the joke that's passed around online forever where it's like describe a movie badly where it's a uh, small farm boy is radicalized by religious <laughs> zealot goes in bo on bombing run at a uh, military installation. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like if you told me that like the rebels in star Wars were religious zealots, i.e., the, the Jedi. Yeah. Like it, <laughs> it adds up pretty well. Um, so yeah, I don't know if they were trying to claim that they're like pro democracy or, I don't know, I don't, anti I just, the bad guys or something. Everything in this movie, like, it was fun that it was taking itself seriously until about midway through. And I was like, man, this movie is so, so self-serious. Like, there, I don't, was there a single joke in this movie? I know. I don't really think so. Not intentionally. It's so self-serious. The other thing, too, that I noticed about this, just from a film, uh, now I understand this is Snyder's style to a certain extent, but, like, I don't think there was a single natural light shot in this movie. The entire thing looked like it was filmed on a sound stage. Like even the prequels where, where Lucas gets so much shit for everything was green screen acting. They at least found every so often a chance to go outside and just, you know, the sun and some <laughs> natural lighting on the characters in this movie. Everything was like this weirdly like drab yet over bright color it just felt weird everything about the movie felt very off yeah almost like you were watching a video game in real life i think snyder would be an amazing music video director i don't know if he ever did i'm sure he did like advertisements where he got into film but like the slick style or, or just like i don't know if he wants to be like a just a digital artist and just like make cool wallpapers for computers like, that's his calling, because I'm looking back on it. I don't know. So there was 300, which was good. 
and Watchmen was a pretty okay adaptation of the source material. I thought Watchmen was good. Like I actually I, thought Watchmen I like was it. good. I as he this man's made, been coasting on 300 for like two decades. He made Sucker Punch, which was one of the worst movies I've ever paid to see. <laughs> so yeah, Sucker was, so there's a there's definitely a through line and it's got to be it's got to be saved for the end part. Yeah. You want to get you want to get into this right now? Let's just get into between it. Between like Sucker Punch and 300 and um some of the stuff that is focused on in Watchmen and some of the stuff that happens in this movie and I don't know if we should like give some type of a warning but like there is I think like one clearly expressed idea in the movie or at least a theme yeah. That so let me goes let after. me go ahead and say right now, uh, there's a theme of sexual violence. Yeah. I will say, or at least threatened, and we'll we'll touch on that now. So if you so, if you're not comfortable with that, get out now. Yeah. So it's not it's not just sexual violence. It is um like empire as like sexual domination. Yeah. And the movie opens with the shot when they're talking about royal bloodlines. It opens with a phallic shaped ship sliding through. So, oh, okay, yeah. All the, the, the narrow rip in space opening <laughs> yeah. rip Jeez. in space. OK, yeah, yeah. Um, which which what I should say they never replicate like, OK, so I would buy it. If this is how travel works in this universe, that they don't have. He just FTF. wanted to show the symbolic thing yes, that we're all never, thinking of when we see it. Right. They are. They never go back to that image, though. It is just there in the intro to sort of set the stage for right. what I think is you're accurate on as to what the bigger metaphor for this movie is. Um, the uh, uh, the the spider fight it's all about the effect of like the pollution on like her fertility and she's attacking the fertility of the uh colonialists yeah, right yeah, because yeah, what, yeah. because what she says is very specific in this scene <clears throat> is that she's talking about her eggs not yep. her children it's right. her eggs and uh the 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 woman um the main character whose name i forget um describes Cora? herself as a Cora yeah Cora like she's like the avatar sequel she describes herself as a child of war and is obsessed with this idea that she can't love. Yeah. Um, so, but also that she talks about how they were put up with like mates in the army so yeah. that they would like fight for each other, like in the pair bond versus um, like, and not worrying about, um, you know, whether the co whether they care about the cause they're fighting for or whatever, which I actually thought was like kind of an interesting yeah, that was twist of on the like you fight for the people in the trenches with you because like it kind of talks about how that can be used kind of propagandistically. Right. Where right. it's yeah. like it's like if you're not if you're thinking about the person next to you, you're not thinking about like, are we Nazis? Right. Yeah. And I thought that was one of the few, that was one of the most interesting parts yeah. of this um backstory info dump that she does i thought it was a very interesting take on so it's very clearly going back to home for snyder with an idea of the uh the way that the spartans if you read your history the spartan barracks idea that like we yeah. encourage everyone in these barracks to be intimate with one another because you will fight harder for people that you have that connection with and i thought it was an interesting twist on that but it also there it's a tinge of that overall theme that it is empire using sexuality as a weapon yeah. that they are weaponizing that in order to get more effort and loyalty and blind loyalty from the people that are in there that they subjugate um they're really worried about the evil soldiers finding out how quote they use the word fertile the land is the line is volunteer nothing about how fertile this land is mm -hmm. right because they're going to dominate it um and then there's i thought frankly the most detestable part of the movie was the very extended yeah threatened it was first of all it was unnecessary yeah for them to like get that 
graphic and detailed with threatened sexual violence. Yeah. And it was way too long. Like, we it's, get it. It was, yeah. only, it was not only way too long, but what kind of really upset me about this scene was that, so, okay, you go into this movie thinking it's going to be a Star Wars knockoff space opera type thing, mm -hmm. and there is sort of an expectation when you go into this genre about what you're going to see and what you're not going to see. And before there was really, because the violence in this movie doesn't start until after this scene happens. This is the, this scene kicks off the first, I, if I'm remembering the, the timeline right, this is the first where like, you know, gunfire starts happening and violence yeah, starts yeah, happening. Yeah. So up until this point, it's playing very by the numbers of a space opera type sh movie and it is so uh, he killed the the leader of the village before this okay right? but it was still it was pretty it was like a, it was quick yeah it was quick it was pretty bloodless if i remember yeah. correctly um but this is so jar it was so jarringly violent yeah and the, the 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 they take great pains to allow multiple screams and the way that he's talking to her about you know, they they drag her into this room and then the captain comes out and you think he's going to be the one that's going to stop things like you can't do this. And he's like, no, I'll have my turn first. And then the rest of you can, you know, finish up later. And it was just it was just so jarring for this genre. And yeah. I wasn't expecting it all. And it was just sort of like it sort of left you feeling just dirty watching. Yeah. this. like, yeah. what the fuck is this? If, if you wanted to make the point of the, you know empire is sexual domination thing you could make the point and it's but it's it lingers it's too it's too graphic it's too specific it mm -hmm. lingers way too long on on all of it and the the soldiers have like way too many lines and yeah. it it i made me it did not make me it made me feel bad for watching the movie, frankly. Yeah. What was worse about it, too, is that, okay, they go through that scene, and it's like, this wouldn't have done this if I was making a movie. They double down on it, like, 15 minutes later. At the cantina scene. At the cantina scene, where there is an aggressive... Um, like, alien guy. Alien guy who wants to yeah. take him upstairs, and, like, I'm going to pay, and I'm going to buy you... And why won't you sell him to me right now? I can go upstairs. We can go upstairs right now. And that was, in a different way, almost as off-putting as the first scene was. Of just this aggressive sort of, now we're moving into, you know, ideas of buying and selling people in this moment. And there's a way to make that point as well without it getting as overtly like mm -hmm. there's one too many lines of dialogue about what where he's going to go. Like he's talking about his sheets upstairs and it's like this yeah. is fucking creepy. This is like yeah. this is not fun. And for a movie where at the core of this genre, the space opera genre, they should be a little fun. These are movies about, you know, heroes and villains and if you want to tell a morally gray story, you can do that, but like this this felt like a director that was reveling a little too much and a writer that was reveling a little too much in the mud and just just detestable subject matter that didn't need to be there. Yeah. It was like, it's like somebody, I don't know, like you could maybe see or somewhere down the line there was the note of like, we should do Game of Thrones in space. And somebody got really confused and he ended up with something that looked kind of like this. It's very weird that it is like the first few scenes of right. the movie are this. It's not later. And especially too with the soldiers, like the implication was clear from their first interaction with like the 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 girl, the victim right. ultimately. Like that that would have been enough. And then you could have had like a vague kidnap scene and then everything could have kicked it. Like there was just like, so many cleaner ways to do it. Like on the whole, like when I was watching this movie, the movie this that when I saw the trailers for this, the movie that I immediately thought of, and I think we mentioned it on the pod when I, when we first started talking about watching this 
was a movie called Jupiter Ascending. Right. Which right. I've seen. It's yeah. by no means a good movie, but it's fun. And you can tell that at its core, that when uh, the Wachowskis wrote it and directed it, there was a sense of sort of wonder to what they were doing. And the movie's a mess. It doesn't hold up at all. But it's, I can at least recommend that if you're on a plane and it's available to watch and you're got, you've seen everything else, yeah, give that a spin. You might like it. It's a little campy. It's fun. Eddie Redmayne obviously decided he was making a different movie than everybody else was. <laughs> With this one, I don't know in good conscience I'd recommend that anyone else watch this movie. I, I just, no, it, it's... it was, it was dull. It didn't really have a lot of original ideas. And even if like you're okay with the idea that this movie is incredibly derivative, there are parts of it that are so bad that I'm like, I don't think I would want someone else to sit through this. Yeah. You're not, there's nothing of value gained. (laughs) You're not going to have fun. It's visually kind of interesting, but there are also parts like when they went to the rebel world where it really felt like. They went to a sound studio. <laughs> like they went to a green screen. Where the like, money ran out. Like when they when they yeah. flew in and they had oh, the shots the of flying like, in. Oh my god! Of the buildings <laughs> where it was like I, you could just tell they ran out of money in this scene. That they were I, out of CGI uh-huh. money for that planet. If you had told me that they were landing on the Clone Wars planet, like they just switched animated styles completely, I would have bought it 100%. That was so, it looked like a 1980s music video. Again, going back to that idea, it was so bad. Um, Another, just a minor dumb thing, just just to, it stuck in my head. Uh, At the end, in the big epic battle at the end, the rebel guy jumps off of the crane and. (coughs) goes through the window to kill the guy uh i thought that guy was a gunner he's clearly in a tiny little window on a piece with a gun attached he was the to pilot the, the ship barely he had the <laughs> controls to the whole goddamn thing what a design flaw <laughs> sorry i just it blew my mind I was like, also, oh yeah he turned the gun off oh no he slammed so, the ship in. <laughs> and so the movie ends with the there's a big confrontation between cora and evil Raul Julia looking space Nazi. Darian Harris one. I had to look it up. His name is Noble. Noble. I don't think it's ever mentioned. If you just, (laughs) he's peaky, he's peaky blinders in space. So continue. (laughs) But like, so there's a fight between him and the heroine, the hero, Cora, I think we said her name is. And he is, he is stabbed And then kicked off this like flying platform to his death. Mm -hmm. And throughout this movie, there is very little to suggest that this person is anything other than just a stock, you know, Grand Moff Tarkin, General Veers, Imperial military leader who is just doing the bidding of someone presumably evil back at Imperium Command. There's one mm-hmm. really weird scene where he's being accosted by a, a, some sort of a tentacle monster. No, like it's, they, I think it's like what that's how, that's how he gets his gets his rocks off. That's what oh. I thought. I thought okay. it was. Well, I mean, yeah. that's how most tentacle monsters work. So, <laughs> um, but there's nothing to suggest this person is anything out of the ordinary. Then all of a sudden, he is being his body is being hauled back onto a ship, and he. His soul is in some astral plane communication with, I don't know if this person is dead or alive, the adopted father of Cora. Cora. And then he's brought back to life, presumably to appear in the sequel. And like, yeah. it was so out of left field. <laughs> like there's been no mention that anything remotely like this exists, that like cloning or I don't know if he's a clone. I don't know if they repaired his body like there's a see it seems to be there was a rebirth thing because he was encased in what looked like a placenta and then the water yeah. breaks and he falls out again like a rebirth kind of thing which is really just we're going to keep this theme going through the entire movie and apparently he'll be back for the sequel when nobody wanted him back for the sequel. So. Yeah that scene really confused me because the 
For the longest time, I thought that was the king. I thought that was the slain king, and they had somehow preserved the slain king. And then, yeah, I realized, like, wait, no, that's just, like, the other military guy. Why, yeah, just the other, other dude. Now, why did he get the treatment? And, yeah, very— Okay, and so I do, have a, I do have a confession to make to wrap please. this all up. I think I'm going to watch the sequel. Because, <laughs> oh. like, now I'm— I, I don't recommend you watch this movie. <laughs> but now that I have watched it, I am now morbidly curious where they go from here. Like now I'm, I'm not bought in, but it's much like, you know, it's like when you drive by a car accident and then see an article about like they shut the highway down and you click on it to read a little more about what you just watched. I'm kind of there on this. I think, <laughs> I think I'll watch part two because I'm a sicko. I don't, I don't think yeah. I will. Yeah. Um, but um, so I'll, I'll say I'll admit this. Um, I watched the uh, Zack Snyder Justice League when that came out. Mm -hmm. I actually thought it was pretty good. Yeah, okay. I, liked, I, I thought I, it was. I, I thought theaters. it was quite. I thought it was quite a significant improvement. Well, you did not. Uh, you, you saw this. You saw the Snyder Justice League in theaters. Um. No. He. Yeah. Because what didn't he? No, I saw I, Batman versus Superman. I saw just oh, Batman versus Superman. Yeah, Snyder cut the Snyder cut of Justice League. I yeah, saw. And I actually, I actually think that the long version of Batman versus Superman is interesting. Okay, bad. We made a lot of, of we made a lot of people mad when we went on our thirty minute conversation yeah, about yeah. this. We won't do. But so I, I thought that I thought that his version of Justice League was like quite a big improvement over Joss Whedon's version of Justice League, but. For this one, I gotta I gotta give this one to Joss because if you want to watch like a good version of this kind of story, just watch Firefly. Yeah. yeah. Grayson, I'm or, glad you went there because I was gonna ask, has anybody liked <coughs> a, a Zack Snyder film since yeah, 2010? And that that is Dawn of the Dead 300 Watchmen. And then after that, I don't think I've liked one. I thought like Batman versus Superman was a miss, but it was an uh, ultimately an okay movie. Like I didn't, I wouldn't say I hated it. There were parts of it that I thought that were kind of cornball, but yeah, he's yeah. corny, but he's like, he's got like ideas, right? And he's trying to do something with Batman versus Superman. And I think overall it's still pretty bad, but it's bad in very interesting kind of ways. And I, find it to be pretty pretty watchable um yeah. this movie less so yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna bet the over on this ip we'll put it that way <laughs> 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 yeah i you can't do that you can't you can't launch an IP with all of these other, the video game, the comic book, that you've got to let it come to you, man. Yeah, like, I was going to say, like, the minute that you say you set out to launch an IP, you're done. Oh, you're done. The fact that you're saying IP and not, I have this beautiful world that is so large and is so many stories to be told that it can't be contained in one medium. Like, that's more interesting than, oh, we want to recreate Star Wars, but we own the intellectual property. Like, man, see, it's so stupid. Where this movie would have worked, this would have worked as, uh, like, Final Fantasy seventeen. This would have worked perfectly as like a very tropey, very typical JRPG where you have the heroine mm -hmm. protagonist where immediately befriends someone in the local village that becomes the first party member that you link up with. Then you go and recruit a couple more party members that all have unique special talents that like, OK, this one has talk to monsters. This one has dual wield blades like their limit breaks are what they're you're really finding out about as you yes. learn about these people and like anything about the story being kind of hacky is covered up by the fact it's a video game and your expectations are instantly two notches lower than they are with a movie or a tv show this would be a perfectly fine video game to kick off a franchise but as a movie it, it everything about this scene there was no there was nothing interesting or new that was trailblazing in this. And what was there is just sort of, man, if you were trying to make this Star Wars, you either missed or shot way too close. And both of them are bad. Yeah. 
cliches are fine. Borrowing from other ideas are fine. You got to subvert it or twist it somewhere. One piece of it. You got to, you got to, you got to shake it up a little bit. What if it, it has was Star to feel Wars? new? Yeah. Right. And this feels new in bad ways. Like, what if it was Star Wars, but we took the worst parts of Game of Thrones and like lopped it on there? I mean, there? they straight up had like Trade Federation people in this movie. Yeah. Did. <laughs> Like they forgot that they like changed their faces a little bit. <laughs> they they did actually kind of look like them too. Right. It was the Michael Scarn version of Star Wars. I really liked the and again, I liked it because it was in Mass Effect. The uh the alien that had its tentacles around the guy and spoke through the human like husk that it was like that yeah. was neat. Yeah. That was nice. Worked in Independence Day too. Yeah, true. True. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Hey, I will say this. Thank you. I guess we can include Netflix in Hollywood at large, uh, for trying a new thing. <laughs> you know, this, this wasn't a pre-existing thing. So you tried a new thing. And the fact that we all didn't like it means fuck you. You're getting more Marvel movies. <laughs> that's actually, that's actually it. <laughs> all right. We tried this, we tried this new thing and they didn't like it. Okay. Here's the further adventures of Luke Skywalker. I know I am very much the problem. Cause I was sitting there watching this movie going, I think I'd have just thrown the budget at a live action mass effect. <laughs> like... <laughs> well, yeah, obviously <laughs> this movie would have made, been made so much better with more Elcor. You wouldn't have need to change much. Actually, no. <laughs> so the visual style alone would have been the same. Slapped a little Mass Effect coat of paint on it. Um, well, yeah, there's your yeah. film room. There's I don't know if there's anything else mood. we, we no. want to talk about. Yeah, this um, it was it. nice for representation. Hmm? It was just the, the heroes were a diverse group. Another way that it's that it's woke. woke. They were all you know, <laughs> that's true. Women, minorities. There was even like a non-binary. Uh, person so you know it was it was just so strange to me after watching it that i was like what did people <laughs> yeah, what, what, what could you possibly have seen about this movie that makes it like anti-woke except for i guess you enjoy the, pro- first the problematic stuff that we yeah. that 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 we that we talked about but still yeah, want I mean, still want to know what's up with anthony hopkins robot don't know part Part two, the Geth come back and they're the bad guys now. Is it, I mean, is it, is it a part of like, like free will that like they were designed to be like, you know, these mindless killers, but even they can like get to a point where they can have a choice and his reason for not committing violence anymore isn't that he's incapable of it now. It's that he is continually choosing, choosing not to. I just think it's yeah. bad writing. Oh, that, sure. Yeah. Like, that robot actually goes on and starts a cowboy themed robot theme park for <laughs> rich people. So <laughs> I mean, we, we, I, we didn't even we didn't even talk about the girl that could bring birds back to life out of nowhere. I thought the twist was going to be that Cora was the one who killed the royal family. And maybe that, I guess that door is still it open. still might come. Yeah. Yeah. But meh. <laughs> I I like that actress. Um, yeah. I forget I forget her name. Um but it just feels like she keeps getting thrown into like attempts at making like franchises that don't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. What would what spot. A, she was in Star Trek into Darkness, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah. That's like and she was I... in the first Kingsman movie. She was the woman with the blade legs. Oh shit. I didn't recognize her from that. Yeah, right. she was in Atomic Blonde. She was in um, The Mummy. She was the, in the Tom Cruise Mummy. No, I didn't see that one. I don't recognize the Tom Cruise editions of the franchise. That was, that, that was one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Um, there's this baffling sequence. Uh, if you want to be here for another hour, we're going to talk about <laughs> Russell, Qu- Russell Crowe's scene as Jekyll and Hyde. But... We, we go in deep on the dark universe in the next episode. <laughs> Season can't get here soon enough. Oh, God. Uh, on that note, Chief, please mercifully end this. Go fuck yourself, San Diego.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Cincy Postcast, which is a production of The Post Cincy. You can go to thepostcincy.com for our website. There you will find written content. You will find links to all of our social media. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and we are putting up videos on YouTube as well. There is also a link to the Patreon page if you for some reason, feel so compelled to financially support us. All of the music you've heard throughout this episode done by Jim Trace and the Makers, a local Cincinnati band that we are huge fans of. You can find more information about them down in the description of this episode. Thank you to all of our sponsors who have helped put this together. And thank you again so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode or have enjoyed anything else that we've done, please like us wherever you may find us, leave a good review, or better yet, share this podcast with a friend, with somebody that you think would enjoy what we're doing. That is the best way we can grow. Please spread the word. And finally, if you are so inclined, please join the Discord server. That is where we are spending a lot of our time online. We've got a nice community there that is talking about FC Cincinnati, local Cincinnati issues, and literally everything else, uh, especially related to soccer, but also definitely not just soccer. So if you want to come hang out with a, a, a lovely group of people, uh, that is the best place to do that. And again, the link down in the description of this episode or on the website. And again, just thank you so much for listening.